Hi, and welcome everyone to Paradox Deep Dive. We are so happy to have you with us today, both you who are joining us from our Stockholm office and you watching the stream from around the world. We have prepared something truly special for you today. Together, we're gonna dive deep and explore Paradox Interactive from the inside and our strategy and growth. The things that makes us unique and the things that makes us stand out. We have a full schedule with lots of sessions and speakers and we divided them into these three chapters. And after each chapter, there will be uh, room for some Q and A's. So please send your questions to our investor relations email ir at paradoxinteractive.com and we will cover it at the end of each chapter. We hope that you're excited to take this exclusive peek under the hood together with us. And uh, let's just jump right in and open up the first chapter here. This is where we're going to let you in on our growth strategy and show you how we plan to seize the opportunities ahead. And the first speaker is someone who says that I just wanted to make the games that I like to play. And he found a group of like-minded people who shared the same drive. Um, and uh, publishing their own games and other titles as well gave them the funds to invest in other games uh, that they believed in. And over 20 years later, he's still in business to do just that. And here he is today, the CEO of Paradox Interactive, Frederick Wester. Welcome. Thank you, Paula, for that nice introduction. And very good to see you all here. And thank you for joining on the stream as well. Um, and uh, actually, I'm going to change my presentation to start with. Uh, so yeah, this is me. I'm going to change how I wanted to start because I got the question, why are you doing this, uh, <laughs> this deep dive into Paradox Interactive? And, and I know some of you analysts, I'm not going to mention any names, you've drawn your own conclusions already, so I'm not going to elaborate on that. But whenever that happens, I get a lot of text messages as well, so it's always a good, refreshing uh, way to know that we're in the media. But um, a common question I get when I'm on a cocktail party, which happens very rarely, by the way, say you're at, at the barbecue instead, is should I invest in Paradox Interactive? Is a very common question I get. And, and it's very hard for me. I'm not an investor by myself. Uh, I'm not a very good investor, at, uh, at least. Um, so I never give any advice to anyone. But I always say that if you're in it for the lo long run, I definitely think you should do it. I definitely sh think you should give it at least a chance. But the main reason we're holding the presentation here today is that for a long time, since I came back as CEO, even before that, we've had a lot of questions about how Paradox works, what are the forecasts? We're not going to give you any forecasts today, by the way. Uh, but wanting to look under the hood of what we're doing, how we're thinking, the abstracts, the strategy, etc. And we have been a bit of a black box in the minds of people. Even if we've created a good company over time, you can see it growing from the outside and you, uh, you still don't really know how we're working on the inside. So in the name of transparency, we want to give you the best possible presentation of how we work, our thoughts, our ideas, our strategy on how to grow and how to make a better company. So what should you expect from Paradox? Speaking in an abstract way again, there are three things US investors should uh, expect from this company. It's top line growth, good EBIT margin, EBIT margin, and uh, a stable cash flow. Those are the three, not one of the three and not two of the three, but three of those three. It's going to look different between quarters. Some quarters are going to be better in one aspect. Another quarter is going to be good in another aspect. But over time, these are the three things you should look for. And uh, you shouldn't judge us as a company by the promises we make. You should ju judge us by two things. The reports and the numbers that we deliver. And if you believe in the strategy that we're presenting here today. Those are the only things. I'm also super happy to say from our perspective that the rumors of the death of the games industry are greatly exaggerated. That was a bit funny, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Good. So we'll start with um, just running into it. So Paradox Interactive is built 
brick by brick, as you can see here. Go back to 1997, uh, where the company Paradox Entertainment was founded. You can see that we release games at a certain pace. It's not a lot of games every year. These are not all the games. These are some uh, picks that we have. Some of the core titles, if you like. So we release sequels. Uh, we release games built by our internal studio, which are, for example, Crusader Kings, Europa Universalis, Hearts of Iron, Stellaris, etc., Victoria 3, uh, and uh, the latest one, we remove this one, Age of Wonders 4. That turned out to be a great release for us as well. We're super happy about that. Combined with that, we have some other releases uh, that are externally developed, like Magicka and like City Skylines as well, the old uh, recognized. So normally we produce a sequel when we need it from a technical perspective, and I'm going to dig a bit deeper into that later on as well. We're not doing it mainly for commercial reasons, because if you take a game like Hearts of Iron 4, it has four times the number of players monthly today than it had the month on release in 2015. <laughs> Almost forgot when it was released. June 2nd, 2015. And um, if you look at the business model, we have changed and adapted over time. So we started out with uh, physical distribution through partners. We licensed out, sent a gold master, basically a disc, to a distributor who would copy this into thousands of different units and ship it around. We started our own physical distribution together with Atari uh, early 2004 and kept on doing that for a long time. We still do some own physical distribution as well, even if it's less than 2% of the total or 1% of the total revenue. We partnered up with Steam for digital distribution in 2007, and already in 2010, around here, uh, we more than 50% of our revenue came through digital. We developed our premium DLC model, starting with Crusader Kings 2, and had a game that was kept alive and just kept on growing as well, up until we released Crusader Kings 3, uh, eight years later. We are also now looking at not only a premium DLC model, which is still the primary driver behind our uh, revenue and growth, but also new value propositions, like how do we present new things that our gamers want and that we can actually produce for them. So um, that is basically um, uh, the brick by brick approach that we've been using ever since the foundation back in 1997. If you want to measure if a video games company uh, is healthy or not, you should follow the MAO, the monthly active users. That will tell you a lot about, do people play their games or don't they? So you can see here, when we started measuring for real, we had the analysis before 2017 as well, but we started at around 2 million and we're quickly, or not quickly, but somewhat quickly, approaching 6 million uh, at the moment as well. So how does the revenue curve look uh, if you compare it to the MAU curve? Well, as long as you keep focused on the core business, it will stay really good. When you start looking at other things, it might dip a bit, but we're actually back and we're following the trend, which is very positive given the recent releases as well. So we haven't got all the numbers, like Age of Wonders 4 is not in here, for example. So again, our absolute top KPI is monthly active users, because if the users are, are there, it's much easier to do business, right? Makes sense? So when we're, we're going to summarize how we're going to grow into the future, we summarize it in tr three different ways, three different legs, if you like. And we call it dig in, stock up and break out are the three ways to grow. Some months are going to be great for one of those. Some months are not. So it's going to vary in between the quarters, even in between the years. But there are th uh, three stable foundations, I would say. If you look at digging in, is focusing on the games we already have live, on the games that we already have in production, and uh, the games that is the core of Paradox Interactive, mainly eight different brands or games at the moment. Building this, the most important thing for us always when we do something is to add player value. Because if you don't add value, no one wants to buy your product. So the core focus on all of these is how can we add more player value in everything that we're doing. 
And the second, uh, the way we do it now mainly is through what we call live game content. It can be DLCs, it can be music packs, it can be different ways to also monetize on this because we're not only adding this for free, but we also charge for it. A lot of it is for free for the people who, who only bought the base game. So if you bought, say, Stellaris when it was released in May 2015, it's a totally different game today because we've added so much free content to it, even if you bought it on a Steam sale at a very low price. So it's a good value proposition for the gamers anyway, in our, in our perspective. We also have a couple of what we call new value propositions that I mentioned before, uh, and that's a new way to approach the market for us, a new way for our gamers to find value and maybe step into our games in an easier way. Because sometimes when you come late into a game, the amount of DLCs and the way to get into the game might be a bit steep, for example. So this is one of the examples we have of, uh, this is the first time we're actually showing any numbers, so you should really bring out your notebooks now. <laughs> So this is, we tried, we've just been trying, we, we added in 2020, in, in uh, January, we started with subscription for one game, if it was Europa Universalis, I think, we added Crusader Kings 2 and Hearts of Iron 4. So we've done basically nothing with this, just added it as a way to consume our games for $5 a month. And as you can see, it's been growing organically, so we are at the moment at around 100,000 subscribers a month, which tells us this is a healthy way for us to grow as well. This is a way that our gamers want us to present maybe the games. So in the future, who knows, maybe subscriptions is also going to be an integrated model in how we approach the games industry. So you can see at least 100,000. This is not going to move the needle a lot, but it's good as a test. It's mostly done with our left hand on titles that are a bit older. So. If you look at Stock Up, the second one, you can see that we also create new games, right? So City Skylines 2 is replacing probably City Skylines, even if I think City Skylines is still going to be around for many years. It's a great game with a lot of content. As we said, we released Age of Wonders 4 that had a really good, is having a really good first month. Um, but not only sequels in the stock up uh, proposition, it's also new IPs. You've all seen Life by You that is developed by Paradox Tectonic in uh, Berkeley. Hopefully releasing in early access later on this year. I don't think we have a date for it yet. And the Lamplighters League that is releasing later on this year as well from our studio in Seattle. So um, it's a twofold way of working with um, when we work here with new IP, we make sure that the studio has a previous track record in the type of game that they're doing, and we're basically going in the direction where the studio creative is really strong. Breakout is the way for us to find super promising games in the market and make them grow unproportionally big. These are two examples. Magica in 2011 was produced by an eight-man uh, student team from the godforsaken town of Skellefteå in northern Sweden and uh, City Skylines in Tampere in Finland uh, by, I think there were 14 people. Very low budget compared to the Sim Cities, for example, of the world. So uh, these are historical breakouts made by small teams that carry a strong creative vision. And we believe that smaller teams have a better creative vision than if you put 200 people together to create a new game. We strongly believe that the foundations of the game is being scaled over time and not only as a splash release to bring in a lot of money in the first quarter, but it's going to grow over 10 to 15 years. And that's how you create stable and reliable and profitable games with a great uh, player value as well. And that's why we started Paradox Arc. So Paradox Arc is our way to find and to locate and to start cooperation with those studios that carry the same creative vision as Paradox does. So they share our way of looking at things. They share our way of the creative vision on how a good game should be. Paradox Arc, so we cast a wide net. We go out wide, uh, the big funnel. And uh, here are the numbers for that. At any point of time, we have 10 to 15 games under consideration, so we work really wide with all developers we can find, basically, that match the criteria of Paradox Interactive. A year, we invest between 75 and 100 million sick, and hopefully to a good uh, return of investment. 
We cancel between 60 and 80% of all the titles that we start engaging in. And the big deal breaker is, is the player retention good? Does this grow over time? Can we make a healthy, good uh, business model with a great player service attached to it? Or can't we? So that's the defining factor of which Paradox Arc is working on there. And Paradox Arc is working a bit on the side of the rest of Paradox Interactive not to interfere with the rest of the business because everyone loves new games. Everyone loves to talk about new games, right? So, so my summary is that there are no shortcuts to a solid organic growth, but we think we're on the right way there, at least. These are the steps on the road. And that's all I'm going to say for today, because I speak too much on behalf of this company anyway, so I'm going to let some other people speak as well. So, Paula, if you want to take over the mic now. Yes, thank, thank you. you so much, Fred. Thank you. <laughs> um, so keep on sending your questions to Frederick and to uh, the other speakers. Um, we are going to cover them, thank you, <laughs> in the uh, end of this chapter. Um, but um, Frederick, he just gave us the recipe for, for growth here. Um, now we're going to examine how to pursue this potential. And it all starts with the fans. The next speaker is someone that I've had many different positions at this company. He started off as the first full-time producer. And he has also been head of studio, head of publishing, COO, and currently he is the chief of staff and he is the second in command to the CEO. Welcome, Matthias Lilja. Thank you, Paula. Um, hey, everyone. So we're going to take a look into... Um, what we mean by tapping our uh, potential, and um, as Paula already gave all, all the way, it, uh, it's about our fans, mostly. Um, not very surprising, maybe. Uh, what you see here on your, I guess, your left is a picture uh, taken right off Steam Spy, just as uh, an illustration of the engagement our fans have compared to other uh, strategy games. Um, these are available, of course. Uh, and we we know that we cater to a, a, a connoisseur audience who really know our games and know the company. Um, they we know they want more content uh, because they say so uh, when we ask them and otherwise as well. We also know that looking back, let's say for September last year, we released content for all our major games at the same time with zero cannibalization between them. So there's room for us to produce more, to give the fans more, and we're not running out of um, we're not running out of DS or running out of business that way. There's also this is a highly demanding audience. You're going to see more about that later today as well. Um, a few anecdotes that might help to remember that is we get sent pictures. Somebody says this tank that you're pre presenting is not the tank you think it is. It's a different tank. Look at the placement on the antenna, or it could be. This village that you placed in Poland in 1936 is actually across the border in Soviet Union. You need to step up your game. So they know what they're talking about. They know the games and they know the, the subject matter. So they, they're not, they keep us honest. We get away with very little when it comes to quality. They decide what's good and we have to live by that and of course want to as well. Um, they can also be, as I said, merciless on, on, on quality. Um, we had a player who played Crusader Kings for several hundred hours and ended with the review, do not recommend. So they do their homework, uh, they're not sloppy. And that's, uh, that's how we like it, of course. So how do we serve our fans in the best way with, the creative, with value? Well, we've identified five main drivers of this. We are already operating in, in all of them, but it, at very different stages. We've come far in some, not so much in others. Um, and I'm going to show you them and talk a little bit uh, about each one. Hard to not be in the way of my own. So mods or modding is something we've done uh, since the beginning. We allow players to we give them access to the, the, the code. They can change aesthetics, game systems, entire games. They can take it all and do a total conversion mod into something else. 
We've allowed all that from the beginning. It's one of the... That and the complex gameplay is one of the reasons mainly why people can play our games for a long time. There's a lot of content and the fans are on board, the community is on board creating that. We've come quite far, we think, in this respect. We could be better at tools uh, for the modders. We could also perhaps help people with presentation, like this is the type of game you play like this, maybe this is also content you want to look at, or mods that might suit you. But otherwise, we've come quite far. The DLC model, probably know that if you know anything about Paradox, uh, CK2 really premiered this and we run it on all games. It works really well. Um, it's, as I said, we cannot produce count content uh, fast enough for our fans. Well, as long as it's good, because if it's not good, they uh, tell us in, uh, both verbally and by not buying stuff. It's very clear. So we need to keep up to their expectations on it. And otherwise than that, it's, it's, we have a, quite a lot of room there. Again, presentation is a thing. Our games live for a long time. A lot of DLCs. What do you pick if you're a new player? Uh, how, do you, how, do we how do you find the content that you might want? That's also an area where we think we can do better, apart from making more. Multiplayer. Again, one of those things that's been around forever. In our games, we didn't support it a lot initially, but we've done, we've taken steps. Quite a lot of people play, and it's, um, it's, not, um, it's not mainly against each other. That could also be hard. Some of our games are inherently unbalanced. Ottoman, um, Ottoman Empire versus Ulm, for instance, would be a tough match. But people play together, so more co-op, and of course, also spectator. So people watch when other people play. And here are things that we definitely could do a lot more with to make that easier to get into, easier to do, and more, more, more fun to watch, for instance. So that's definitely an area. Multiplayer, uh, by the way, is it's harder to do on a live game. It's more, more suited to do on a new game, perhaps a sequel, where somebody really tackles it from the multiplayer angle. A lot of systems and other things need to be built from the ground up to really exploit this uh, possibility. Paid UGC, this is uh, any type of content created by fans that uh, where we have a, a, let's say, a royalty split. We do this uh, in cities, Skylines quite a lot today with content creator packs, um, where we fans do it, we curate it, and then it's sold and, and, and we share the revenue. This satisfied the, the of course, the, the makers of the, the content gets paid, which is good for them, so they can do more of it. The fans already want more stuff, and we know that, so this is a perfect way of uh, feeding into that. And we, of course, supply the platform in, uh, as the game, and, and it's part of the revenue share. Accessibility. Again, one of those uh, that we struggle with from the beginning, we have really complex games, and we don't want to dumb them down, because fans don't want dumb games, they want complex games that are easy to get into. Um, accessibility is probably where we have most way to go. Again, this is also a game, um, sorry, a feature that we probably do best in new games. You build it from the ground up. If you see the earlier generations of Grand Strategy games versus the later, you see Stellaris taking huge steps this way. The game is not, it's not a wall of info that you have to climb. It's more of a steep staircase. And we could probably keep leading that even more. And it's probably done best through sequels, new games. But you can do things um, um, in live games as, as well. So, um, player value, we need to stock up on the right uh, items we need to have uh, and paradoxically enough it's a lot about not releasing games it's about killing stuff and killing it early uh, again the core quality is not to release bad things and the earlier we can stop this something that is not going as we thought it would or hoped it would the better it is our current kill rate taken from 2013 so in 10 years is about 47 percent so the mortality rate of games among games at Paradox is very high. About one in two see the light of day. Fred mentioned Ark. They have, of course, even more aggressive uh, numbers for not releasing or not going to early access with games. This is, um, this is key for us to remember that this is something we have to do. Usually you don't see this, uh, and you shouldn't as investors, because we have to stop it early. 
Sometimes you see it as a, as a write down, but that's of course a specific type of failure where we've gone quite far in a project before we have to realize that this is not going to work. So 10 years, 28 released games, five what we call endless, I'll talk more about that. 15 what would be dubbed profitable, and then eight misses would be the thing. That would land us on a 71% hit rate from profit with profitable to endless being hits and break even. Uh, we have a special category here called break even, but they also fall into the misses. We have higher expectations than getting our money back. Um, an endless game is not born like that. They are launched and then worked on until they become endless. It is a constant, uh, constant flow of us doing things, getting feedback from the fans, the fans pitching in with modding, and over time it becomes something that just keeps going. We can keep investing in this with good returns and we have the players with us. We have uh, five of these games today. We also launched um, Victoria 3, fairly recently, and of course Age of Wonders 4. They are profitable now, they're over there on the right end, because they're fairly young. They haven't been able to develop into Endless. We don't know if they will, we have high hopes, we don't see any reason why they shouldn't, but it's going to be quite a lot of work to get there, as always. And the fans decide ultimately what, what this is. So, trying to summarize this, would be that we, we dig in and stock up, uh, on the, we do more of what works, we, we build more on that, and we focus on always on player value, uh, and we do that in a disciplined way, um, not getting carried away when things work, and thinking that it's easy to operate when you're not at your best, we should stay close to that. If you look at 2022, this is a rough sp uh, split between uh, green is released, which I, I've referred to as live mostly in this presentation. Pipeline is the games in development. And ARC, the 9% is uh, the more experimental titles that Fred mentioned. Um, this shifts quite a lot for us uh, during the years. It's not particularly static, depends on long, long dev um, development time for games. And when they launch, of course, shift, things shift from, from um, purple to, uh, to green. Um, of course, things from Arc might go either directly live as an early access game, but it might also be we see the potential here, we need to do something more with it, so we're going to uh, uh, put some dev resources in it and, and release it. So both of those might happen over time. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're not going to change how we invest in these uh, categories, but we're going to change the content mostly on the on the purple one, which is development. We're going to look deeper into what is our core, how do we work on sequels, and do things we're good at or better at, and take more calculated risks, especially than using ARC as the, this is an experiment, let's accept that it is an experiment and try it over there where we handle risk better. This is what we think will be more, do more risk-adjusted return that makes sense over time for Paradox. Um, again, we get nowhere unless we have a high bar for, for quality and, uh, and we make sure that we, we always hit the targets we have. Um, so keeping an unsentimental view on what games get to li live and launch and what doesn't is also all, it's going to be key for us in the future as well. Um, and again, to become an endless game, which of course is the goal of everything we do, we don't always succeed, but that's always the goal, it's the players who are going to decide that. We talk to them, um, they help us out by making mods and other things, and we, we work together, and over time, uh, we hope to get there. That was all uh, for me, so back to Paul. Thank you, thank you. And uh, just as Matthias showed you, our focus on player value is relentless, and our players are the foundation uh, for our very existence. Now we're going to dive deeper into that. Who are these players? What makes them tick? Why do they love our game so much? And two people who can tell you all about that um, and who sits on a treasure of qualitative and quantitative data um, are Annabelle and Stefan. And they can't wait to share some golden nuggets with you. Please welcome Annabelle, Silvia 
Rojas, uh, Head of Data and Analytics, and Stefan Eld, uh, Head of User Research. Welcome. Yes, uh, thank you. So we are here to talk about the PDX player. So um, before we start with that, uh, we want to give a bit of introduction into what we do here at Paradox. So um, my name is Annabel. I'm the head of data and analytics at Paradox, and I lead a team of around 10 people working on our data platform and analytics and BI. And our focus is basically uh, working with the game teams on understanding what our players are doing, how they're playing the game, or of course, looking into player numbers and things like that. But to get an even better understanding of the players, we work a lot with user research and Stefan's teams. Yes, so my name is Stefan Eld, and I'm the head of the user research team. And as Annabel said, uh, you try to figure out what the players are doing. And then my team of eight researchers, we try to figure out why are they doing these things? What motivates them to play our games? So in the next few slides, we will try to explain to you uh, what we know about our players. But we thought it'd be interesting first to look at some actual numbers and some stories from our players. So let's see, Annabelle, what we have. Yes. So. Um some of the things that our players been up to in 2022. So there's been a lot of murders. So 26 million murders in Crusader Kings um, done both by players and AI characters. Uh, we also had uh, a lot of Eiffel Towers built uh, in Victoria 3. Uh, then we have 95 billion citizens in city skylines. So uh, this is basically all our players, great cities that they've been building during the year, as a lot of citizens, and then 20 million wars won in Hearts of Iron, of course. Uh, and then le uh, last but not least, they've been colonizing the galaxy in Stellaris. So 27 million planets colonized in total. Uh, so, yes, our play has been up to a lot of things, but Stefan, maybe you can share why. Yeah. We thought it'd be interesting to sort of understand, so what is it they actually do when they play like this, the things they create? Why do they do it? And I thought I'd share a few just examples of player stories. Uh, for example, we can have a player who says, well, I believe a lot in being a pacifist xenophile, and I believe so hardly, I, I, hard in this message, I'm going to battle my way through the galaxy to make other people believe it too. That could be a typical Stellaris scenario. Or we can have people who go, well, when I have my enemies, I will torture them. I will torture them by reading poetry. So you need to have a game that lets them do this. And that's, of course, it's a CK game. Some other people, they may be more inclined to running a business. So they may say that, well, I'm going to become the most profitable and the biggest banana producer in Central America. And I'm going to make sure I share that wealth together with my upper class. Typical Victoria scenario. Or if you're more so inclined, you can talk about intersections, roundabouts, windmills with other peers in order to plan how to make traffic flow in your City Skylines game. These are typical stories from our players. But it doesn't really explain who these people are. So we thought we'd show you a little bit more of that. Uh, yes, so starting by looking at some demographics, of course, our players are more diverse than this, but this is basically looking a bit on average and the general view of our players. So majority men uh, around uh, the ages of 25 to 35 years old. Um, they have a higher education, so it could be academics or within tech. Uh, and employed, uh, but most importantly, they have time to play. Uh, so they have time to play, and as uh, previous mentioned, they spend a lot of time playing our games. Uh, so if you have this much time to play, what are you looking for? So all players are looking for a strategic challenge. Uh, so this is something that they can plan ahead, um, kind of just take time to try to control the outcome of the game, um, experimenting and stuff like that. So 
not something that is fast paced or that requires a fast reaction time, but more something that they can spend time to plan and strategize uh, about their games. Um, so Stefan, maybe you can go a bit into strategy. Yes, because a strategic challenge you can find in a lot of different games. So uh, all players have their motivations as to why they are playing a game. So what we have attempted to do is try to understand what the motivations are for these people. So in our work we have identified, I would say, six different uh, player groups or player motivations. Uh, this doesn't mean that every player sits in one single category, they can be in several, but all in all we'd say that we have six different types of categories or motivations that bring people to play strategy games. And our games cater perhaps not to all of them, but I would say uh, we have four player groups at the bottom of the screen and they are all playing our games, but they are the smaller groups for us. So for example, we have at the bottom corner over there, we have the chill and create group. They are more looking for a quick burst of escapism. They want a quick playthrough. They want a game that is easy to pick up and sort of quick to put to the side whenever they have time. And on the other side, we have the peer and prestige people, and they are more people looking for a competitive game where there is uh, maybe a winning or a losing state, uh, and usually play together with other players, so a multiplayer uh, player. But what we have come to realize when looking at the people playing our games, not surprisingly perhaps, is that we have what we call the proficiency players, uh, and we also have those who seek a lot of freedom in their games. And I have chosen to call these groups the hardcore specialists and, not surprisingly, the storytellers. These two groups represent more than half of our player base. And if we look at the hardcore specialists first, uh, they're the smaller of the two big groups. Um, what they look for, they look for a challenge. They want to be playing a very complex game. There can never be too many rules. They love mechanics. And if a game was a car, they'd be looking at the car and they go, really nice, really interesting. Let's open the hood. They want to see if they can make this car run faster. Or can I make this car run longer on the same amount of fuel? So for them, it's all about understanding how can I use this to my advantage, min maxing. But they're not only happy with that. For them, it's important that they can be creative in how they solve problems. So they want to be able to run into, let's say, similar problems in separate playthroughs. They want to be able to approach and solve the problem in different ways. So quite a challenging player to have. These players, they uh, like to talk about, they like to think about the game and how they're going to you know, play the game as best as they can. So they like to share ideas with each other. So they are active on various forums and communities. That's good for us because that means we can reach them uh, to talk about uh, all the fantastic things you can do with our games. And not very surprisingly, these are avid gamers. So gaming for them is an important activity. If you move over to the storytellers, for them, playing the game is all about immersing themselves into a new world. They want to play and experience and tell long, epic stories. Uh, they are a bit like the hardcore specialist in that they want to experiment too, uh, but not for the same reasons. Uh, the hardcore specialist, he wants to sort of see if, can I push the engine here? They just want a vehicle that can take them wherever they want to go. So they need a car that can bring them out into the jungle or into a very crowded urban area. So for them, it's more what I can do with the game. So they want to push the story, the narrative of what they're playing. Also interesting is that these people tend to be less about communicating what they're doing. This is me time. I sit down in front of the computer and I want to do something, tell the story for myself. It's a space for reflection, not to share and talk with others. And we can help them get this as long as we provide them with an open world and uh, narrative elements, then they will be really happy. So those are the two major groups that we have. Demanding players, but really good to have. What we haven't talked about is, so how do they go about choosing which game they want to play? Yes, so um, looking a bit on the, our game portfolio, so 
just a quick number. Uh, we can see that about 30% of our players uh, own two or more PDX games. Um, and then looking a bit into what games they choose. So we talked a lot about strategy. Uh, they like a strategic challenge, which I think our games provide. Uh, but uh, we do have a large portfolio. So uh, what we can see is that uh, the game that they choose is based on their interest. So uh, if uh, the players are more into history, like more historical settings, they might play something like Crusader Kings or Europa Universalis. If they're more into building and in more a present setting, they might choose cities. Or if they're more into a futuristic sci-fi uh, fantasy um, setting or interest, uh, they might choose something like Solaris or Age of Wonders 4. Um, so they uh, tend to uh, choose the game based on their interest, not necessarily mixing um, uh, games that are in different settings. Uh, but keeping with it those interests, basically. Uh, and then looking a bit into how they plan their sessions or they play sessions. So we said that they have a lot of time to play. Uh, and what they do with this time is basically uh, planning their sessions with a clear goal in mind. So this could be something like, for example, I want to be the biggest banana producer while making my upper class very wealthy. Um, and then, okay, I need time to do this and achieve my goals. So then I will time box my time and plan for uh, achieving that. So that could be planning your sessions around weekends where you have more time, stuff like that. Um, yes. So they're looking for a strategic challenge with a clear goal in mind, but then how are what does our games kind of provide? What purpose are, does our game have in their play sessions? Yeah. So what we can see, what we talked about, is that our players, they are quite invested in what they're interested in. They have very much knowledge in what they're doing. They have a very special interest that our games can help them uh, work with. Uh, our games can help them learn things. So uh, even if you're quite well versed in a specific area, quite often our games are so, I would say, broad and deep that you can always learn more things in your specific field. So a lot of people come to play our games to learn things. Uh, we've also seen that we have a lot of players who come because they want a new challenge. They have played other games, uh, but they've heard about Paradox games. And so they're sort of curious about, well, maybe I should take my strategy gaming to the next level. And that is exactly what we are. So they come to us to try out new things. Um, that could also be when we release new content, of course. That gives them another reason to come back and sort of see if they can excel at this particular theme. And uh, as we also mentioned, of course, if you're very knowledgeable about something, you tend to sort of follow and read up and, and watch things in this particular area. And we've also seen that a lot of people, they come back to play our games because they saw something on TV or they read something somewhere. So they start making these stories in their heads saying, hmm, I wonder how would that work if I tried that out in, in EU or in Stellaris or something. So they have all these scenarios in their heads and they go, this game can help me try to figure out how that would happen if I tried it out. So that can bring them back to the games. And whenever we also release content, if you have an interest in that area, you go, ah, at last I can try this out. Ooh, now I have more to do in this particular country. So that brings people back constantly to our games because they get to uh, sort of work even harder and deeper on their specific interests. So thanks to that, they come back regularly. And I think you have a couple of numbers on that. Yes. Uh, so like mentioned, they return regularly. And how can we see this in numbers? So. About 60% of our Mao are retained players. And with retained, what we mean is basically that you played during the last 30-day uh, period and also you played during the previous 30-day period. So you played during two consecutive 30-day periods. Um, then we can also see that about 30% of Mao is reactivated players. So these are players that have not played during that previous 30-day period but been active in some other period before that. So 
it could be that they're coming back for a release, a patch, a mod uh, update, or and something else that piqued their interest. About 40% have been playing for more than a year. Uh, so players that have been active in our games for the past year, or yeah, for the past year, has also been active uh, some way, some time before that as well. Um, and then to summarize basically what we were talking about, so our players like to have a strategic challenge, they like to plan their sessions, they spend a lot of time playing, and they also stay with us and they purchase content regularly over time. So I think that wrapping up our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And please stay and let's welcome in Fred and uh, Matthias again, because it's time for a Q&A session uh, since we're wrapping up this, um, this first chapter here. And um, for you who are sending in questions, uh, keep on sending them in. And if we don't have time to um, answer all of them during these sessions, we will follow up every single one of your emails and reply uh, straight to you uh, after the show. But let's see. One of the questions here in general, um, your strategy of returning to the core, specific, is that specifically about investing in fewer products overall or how do you, what do you have to say about that? Um, I think we look for opportunities. We don't have a number of games we have to invest in. We don't want to invest. It will be few if we don't find good opportunities. It will be more if we do find more. I think it's the simple answer. Uh, it's a very good, a very good summary. And, and we invest in a lot of different things. But we, have, we keep a, a high kill rate because we only invest further in the games that are good enough for our portfolio. So... Hopefully a lot of games, but uh, we will see. Mm -hmm. All right. Then there's a question about the digging in, uh, Fred, that you covered in your presentation. Uh, which one of these aspects in the digging in do you believe will provide the strongest potential for growth? There's a question here. <clears throat> I... I think that, and we know that our gamers want us to produce more content for the games and the content velocity has been lagging a bit. So I think the most obvious and the lowest hanging fruit is increasing content velocity overall uh, across the board on all our games. So I think that's the fastest way for us to grow on revenue and the safest way. But there are many different ways to do it. But if, it, if I can only choose one way to do it, it's obviously that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, how much growth do you foresee coming from current live games vis-a-vis -vis new titles? Uh, we don't make predictions, <laughs> uh, but we have high expectations of all of them. That's why they're in the portfolio. Yep. Uh, then there's a question about the player groups that you covered, Annabelle and Stefan, in your presentation. Um, you focus there on two of the six um, strategy player groups, um, any chance you will find further growth in the other audiences? How would you do that in that case? Well, I would say first and foremost, like Fred said, I think we can still find growth within the two large groups that we have. So there's still room for growth there. And of course, when it comes to the other groups, I'm sure we can find particular areas in which we can do better. We mentioned the multiplayer, for example, that could be an area. So we will, of course, look into the motivations that various groups are looking for to see is there something we can do there, low-hanging fruit or long-term fruit, so to speak. But uh, I think growth in one or two smaller areas, but focus on the two big ones. All right. Uh, people are also wondering about value drivers. By when do you plan to have developed far enough to have tapped into our value drivers? Can you scope the potential for us? Matthias. Yeah, it's the same kind of answer. Um, it's going to be ongoing. We've, we've come a long way. Uh, in some of them, we've like modding, we're f far along, accessibility, multiplayer, less so, with the others in between. Um, as we keep growing and Mao keeps growing, I don't think we'll run out. Mm -hmm. um, and we might even find more than these five, but those are the ones that we're uh, the coming years are going to focus on. 
Thank you. Do we have any questions from uh, anyone in the room here? I can see some hands over here. I will move over. Thank you, Martin Anel with uh, DMB Markets. So I have a question. H how do you categorize a game going from profitable to endless? Sort of what, what's the hurdle for you in, in that ca category <coughs> discussion? Um, it's not a hard number. It's uh, if we can keep investing and having good returns and fans are happy with what we do, we will keep doing that and that's the criteria for being endless. They are not the same. All of the five games are not um, identical. They're quite different in size, but they all share that. So um, one way of looking at it, how, ex how effectively can we make content and how much do people want it? Uh, so it's more the time arise and, and as long as it makes sense to us, if that makes sense. Just one question on Paradox Arc. Uh, what's the most successful uh, game spun out of, of that project? We started our first uh, release was in August last year, and that was across the obelisk that we think also fulfilled the criteria for being uh, added into the, into the general portfolio. Um, so the retention is good. Game is getting great reviews. I think we have 91% positive of, on Steam, and, and we think that there is room to develop this game further. Uh, so we'll probably add that as well. We released uh, Mechabellum uh, last uh, week on the 11th of May, showing some promise. I had hoped for a bit more, to be honest, but I think it's, it's doing okay as well. So, and we're going to see more releases uh, throughout this year. So hopefully, like I didn't mention any numbers, but hopefully we can add one game a year to the portfolio or so from the Paradox Arc, uh, considering that we've looked at probably 70, 80 games uh, during that year and signed probably eight to 10 of them. So, so give, just to give you a view of the hit ratio of the games that we see. But retention is the driving factor. The Mao and the retention will be the uh, deciding factors whether we continue with the game or not. <coughs> I saw another hand raised over here, so let's get the mic to you. Fredrik Stenches, Svartbank Rober. For these two new IPs that are coming this year, Life by You and uh, Lamplighters, it would be interesting to hear how you think of them in terms of the, the five value drivers and also in terms of the um, player characteristics or the personas for those two. Yeah, so uh, concerning the personas and the play types for these two games, they are of course a little bit outside what we have done historically um, for Life by You. I, I believe that that is definitely a game that uh, fits a lot of the things that we're talking about. A game that offers a lot of or endless possibilities in, in uh, shaping your game. So that's of course what we're looking for. So, uh, But yes, it, uh, these games are targeting somewhat a new play play base for us which is good because that forces us also to try to find players outside of our uh, sort of normal play base so it's good for us um, and just adding a bit on like the things that we look at from like a, a data perspective is basically just tracking seeing like do they have the same we of course want them to come back that's kind of been the, what we want to achieve with all our games so then that's what we are going to be looking at is that basically what happened with this uh, with these players as well over time and um, in terms of those five value drivers with uh, DLCs and modding and uh, and so forth yeah um, life by you is designed as a platform for modding uh, and has potential and we will probably do something along the lines of page UGC there um, at least lends itself to it. Again, execution dependent. We will try things and see what the fans, uh, as long as they're with us on that. Um, Light, Lamplighters League is less, um, less uh, I think, moddable. Uh, it's more of a, a um, single player experience. So it's more, uh, I would say that's a, a, another step outside the uh, what we usually do, but it's uh, a, it's a strategy game or a tactical game that we hope people will enjoy. But on, um, yeah, they they hit different on the on the drivers. Hi, Simon from Simon Johnson from ABG. Uh, you have talked for a long time about content velocity. Could you maybe explain a bit about you know the the main obstacles for it and how you are tackling it? 
for increasing the Is that, is that mine? Uh, you're looking at me. Do you yeah. want to say <laughs> You can start. I'll, I'll fill in if <laughs> All I, right. Okay. If I I'll start and you correct. Smart. I'll yeah. start and you correct me. Um, uh, quality is always going to be the thing. How? What can we create that fans want? <clears throat> the, the tempo itself is is limited by by the value that we can create. I think is the main the main hurdle. It's not a technical issue per se. Um, of course, games that have been live for a long time run into different kinds of problems. It might be tech depth, it might be what else is interesting here as we explored new things. So it de depends quite a lot on what game you're looking at. It's not going to be the same answer for Victoria that's just live and doing post-launch support and also want to do DLCs and EU4 that's been going for 10 years and have done quite a lot So what's left there. So it's not the same answer uh, depending. And we also have to be uh, innovative in the way that we approach the market as well. So we don't get stuck in a model where we only produce the same thing over and over again. But we actually follow what people are expecting and what people <coughs> want in the market as well. That's where uh, user-generated content plays a very interesting role. Um, and that's also something we have to work with internally every day. I mean, if you just take such a simple thing as music, we didn't produce anything in that aspect five, six years ago. And we have a pretty big... You know, music production at the moment, not that it moves the needle too much, but just to give an example. Uh, so <clears throat> there are a lot of things to be done uh, on it. And, and we've basically been producing big DLCs with everything included in that. We haven't elaborated too much on, for example, story-driven experiences, just smaller ones, not more graphic-heavy ones. So there are many avenues to take. So um, I, I think it's a mix in between the two. Uh, just a follow-up. So do you have any examples of what you're like the most unhappy about um, what you could do better in terms of the velocity? I, I think from time to time our worst competitor is ourselves. Uh, and that is always, um, there's always an unwillingness and it's not, it's not unique to, to Paradox. It's, it's with all companies, I think, and, uh, in general, but software and gaming companies in, in the particular that you see your own product every day and all you see are the faults with the product and you're unwilling to let it go. Uh, so I, I, it leads to a lot of, of delays, for example, and so I, I, I think that's a, p a part of it, a part of the problem, and, and uh, we need to stop competing with ourselves, I think, to a certain extent. But uh, maybe you have something better on that. I think that's the that's the main thing. Uh, we've seen that they sometimes take longer rather than shorter to do, and I think um, finding ways to releasing more often and maybe not always as big. I think, but that's along the line that Fred said, it's always hard to, we're, we're fierce critics of ourselves. So that's uh, teaching the teams what good enough means and we know what the fans want. But we're, we're inspired as well by different companies, like a lot of the online <coughs> gaming companies, they're releasing stuff every week. And uh, I know that the Stellaris team uh, is releasing from their custodian team, for example, much more often than the others. Not things that we charge for, but just to keep the player base like updated and, and uh, come out with new content. So we, we can also learn from within the different teams. So different teams within uh, Paradox has different things they're uh, innovating and, and experimenting with to, to actually make us better as well. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And we have a final question from this side of the room. Here we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a question about the long tail. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation about the players, average 25 to 35, and also historical, present, and, and future fantasy. And my question is, uh, how long time do you see the average player be a customer and a player uh, in each of these areas? And the question is then, of course, lifetime value uh, of the players and how this has developed over time. When do you get bored or, or leave or do something else? Uh, yes, that's a good question. I can't share specific numbers. Uh, we do look at that kind of stuff uh, for the games and it's very um, different from game to game as well. Um, so don't really have a good answer <laughs> other than we are looking at that kind of stuff um, and that the main thing that we are seeing is that players are returning back so the the different thing looking at things like lifetime for example what is lifetime mean like is there over there like we could have we probably have fans that have been playing our games since we started making games right so are we counting that 
long time period or are we talking about one year or just a few months uh so those it's a, a tricky question but definitely something that we are looking at internally i also think that we we see we see players of all ages and 25 to 35 might be the spot where people have a lot of time to play but it doesn't mean that they don't play when they're older and we for sure know that people start when they're much younger so we have we have a file where but you said this is the normal well, if we had to define a typical player, that would be it. So we, we're, we're not seeing any, we don't see this the trailing off for or being weakened. Yeah. The difference between the different type of players in this area. We don't have that data right now, but yes, there, there are differences in the games, how they, uh, demographically, how they look. All right, thank you so much. Lots of interesting questions. Um, this is when we wrap up the first chapter of this program. We'll take a quick break and when we come back we're going to talk about how, what goes into making these games. So uh, we'll be right back to Paradox Deep Dive where we are exploring the inner workings of Paradox Interactive and we just wrapped up the first chapter where we looked into our strategies and the fundamental relation to the players. Now we're entering chapter two, and uh, this is where we're actually going to look into what goes into making these games, making, bringing these great ideas to life. And the first panel today uh, of chapter two um, is going to ask itself how to find the fun in a challenging and the complex. And uh, this panel and the next few panels are going to be moderated by Marcus Halleberg, our uh, communications manager here at Paradox, who actually put this program and this day together. Uh, and I'm going to leave it over to you, Marcus, to introduce uh, the panel. So, now that we've gone through our corporate development, it's time to dig into the nuts and bolts of Paradox. And something that, that is at the very center of our game development is our game pillars, Alice, which summarizes how we think we can find the fun in the difficult. And to discuss this, I have three of our senior game directors with me. Please welcome on stage. Thank you. So without, test, test. In, without internal hierarchy, <laughs> we have Daniel Moregord, our game director for Stellar, previous game director of Stellaris. Used to work. Is this on? Yeah, it's on. It's for oh. the. It's on. Okay. Yeah, uh, I used to work on uh, Stellaris. Yeah, exactly. And now working on an unannounced title. Yes. Lennart Sass, game director for Age of Wonders 4. Big congratulations, and also studio manager of Triumph Studios. And last but not least, our own creative, chief creative officer, Henrik Foreus. Welcome. Thank you so much. So instead of going deeper into your pedigrees, <laughs> I thought we'd run right into the topic. And let's start with our slogan. We make the games, you create the stories. What does that mean in your work? Want to go first? Sure. Yeah, no, I, can, I can do that. I think it's a great slogan. I think it perfectly encapsulates what makes us special. Uh, we make replayable games that you can come back to and be surprised every time, experiencing new stories. We don't make games that are based on a plot, like a movie, that might be entertaining once, and then that's fine. Uh, we make games you want to play forever, essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we applied that, uh, that slogan directly to our latest game, Age of Wonders 4. Um, this was the first game that we developed fully in cooperation with, uh, with Paradox Interactive. And um, yeah, it's basically as, as game directors, you like to be, you know, sort of in charge, right? You, it's, you're, you're projecting a particular view on, on your game. But this is really about making the player central because my uh, fantasy for world domination might be different from your fantasy of world domination. So uh, it's, it's very useful and it gives three advantages. Like one is ensuring that we appeal to a wide variety of users, a very diverse set. Secondly, uh, it helps with replayability because you can try different stories to generate different stories, not just a finite story. And thirdly, uh, the structure that we build ensures that it's highly uh, expandable. So you can uh, you can just 
keep on adding new elements that allow us to generate new stories. So that really drives the the growth of our of our games. Yeah, definitely. Because, uh, like you said, you know, like all these alternatives you have or things you can do in the game, it really empowers the player to tell their own stories. Because we aren't designing stories that we want to tell other players uh, or players, like many other games do. Uh, we don't have a certain type of plot or a certain type of story that we're trying to convey, but rather we build these tools that allow the players themselves to sort of have fun and create their own worlds and their own imagination and like forge that into their own player stories. And I think it's really a powerful tool. And um, for us, it's really been something that really sets us apart. Uh, and for our games, I think it's made us very successful with what we do because we're able to capitalize on that really well. Yeah, no, it's our art. Yeah, exactly. Our art form is creating those systems mm -hmm. that create these stories for people. Uh, mm -hmm. To use a bit of industry lingo, this refers to emergent narratives, which is a holy grail for us as a company and, of course, as an industry. What, in your experience, is most important or critical when trying to facilitate those player or emergent narratives? Yeah, it's something I've thought about a, a lot. I've held talks about that <laughs> as well at the GDC. Uh, you know, for me, at least for what works in strategy games, it's the struggle between independent free agents, like these can be AI agents. They're pursuing their own goals, um, competing over the same limited resources like the players are. And in that conflict, if they can express their personality and their opinions of each other and you, uh, you will have emergent stories, essentially. So it's one way of still thinking of that in strategy games. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's like this, uh, just to make it more clear exactly what emergent stories is, emergent stories are st stories that emerge from the players engaging with the game. These are not stories that we have created, but it's rather uh, circumstances that happen to the player and therefore they emerge. So it's, a, it's a really fun to see these kind of things where we are putting in these individual puzzle pieces in our games and then when the uh, players are engaging with the games and playing with these AI actors that uh, Hendrik talked about, for example, there could be you know, narratives or stories that emerge that we've written, but then it, doesn't, it changes the whole, the whole, like what it all, the whole overarching story is about. And that's really what, what kind of stories that do emerge. So on a higher level, there's a, a really interesting narratives that can really be created from these smaller pieces in ways that we have not designed or intended or even thought about, which is really cool to see when the players uh, have these amazing moments of these random events that happen. Yeah. And for that to work, you basically need to create like a, a huge amount of systems that all interact. Some, mm -hmm. Sometimes we call that uh, logic soup. And it's for the player to decide like to wit with which systems do they emer uh, interact with more. Uh, mm -hmm. Like if you are a more diplomatic player, you want to engage more with diplomacy systems. But it's also tied to the war system uh, like, uh, the, that has an effect on the diplomacy system and so forth. And all these interactions between all these little machines create new uh, narratives. And I think one of the next pillars that we're going to talk about, which is the, the living worlds, like a huge part of creating those emergent narratives. Mm -hmm. right? And we'll get back to that later, so yeah. save some <laughs> of the good stuff for the end of the <laughs> panel. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit reductive, but in a sense our games are quite sandboxy as we give the players a high degree of freedom and tying into the logical soup, how do you set and follow a wish, vision that on one hand encompasses all the opportunities we want to give the player, but on the other hand is also a smooth and cohesive experience in our sandbox? Cool. cool. Yeah, I mean, it's all about the player experience. Uh, the systems are there to give the players an experience and uh, say, again, it's a strategy game, I want to take Skåne from the evil Dane. So, uh, you know, how can I do that? Well, I can declare war, that's one system. I can do it through intrigue, by murdering the Danish king, perhaps, and letting my son inherit. <laughs> or I can do it through diplomacy, buying it, or something. Right? So, these are ways that different systems serve the same um, goal for the player, but in different ways, so that they can sort of live out their fantasies. Mm -hmm. I think also, like uh, what you said there with, or, um, with the original question, I think um, something that's also like, difficult on like, how to get there is just we just need to, to some degree, trust our own um, intuition or like, what our vision is and how close we are to getting to that vision and like, what the player experience should be. And it's a lot about just like, having that experience, 
talking to, for example, beta testers and so on, talking to your team members, continuously playing and testing the games and trying to understand them as a player as much as you can. So having that connection with both you know, your, your uh, our, uh, development colleagues, but also uh, beta testers and so on is very valuable mm. for getting that feedback and seeing that you're on the right track. And then also not sort of being too tied to your own ideas. Because in the end, it's a, sort of what the players like and what opportunities can happen that matter. Play your value first. Yeah. So kill your darlings in case it's not actually making it better for the players. Like those are. Yeah. There's no like formula how to do all of that. It's very difficult. But it's all about just having that sort of end goal in mind and having an open mind and uh, mm. trying to find our way there. Sort of. I think uh, also like a big part of, of it is, is uh, creating those systems within a setting which is highly appealing and worlds uh, world as a yeah a place where the systems resonate with the player right so they have a pre-existing interest in world war ii or in the middle mm -hmm. ages or in fantasy yeah. and i think that that really helps making these complex systems uh, uh relevant uh, to the user definitely i think uh, having a familiar subject matter makes it a lot more inviting which is also one of the pillars we have yeah. which makes yeah. it a lot easier for players to get into uh, the games mm -hmm. sure i want to dig in a little bit to the player experience and player feedback because understatement of the day you all have very strong creative visions and opinions but all of you also have your own respective high councils who also have very strong creative visions our fans how do you balance the creative idea and intuition you have with uh, our fans creative requests and i actually want to start with you leonard because you have an actual high council uh yeah we have a, a, a collection of um of, of highly engaged uh, uh fans of our games which we um uh, which we ask to try out the game at a very early stage in, in development to ensure that we have particular ideas because in the case of like Age of Wonders we make a sequel but we want to ensure that our games are not stuck in the past so we need to find a very good balance between innovation uh, attracting a new audience and realizing growth as we've seen with Age of Wonders 4 and uh, still uh, keeping our old fans on board because in many ways they are our evangelists of you know, with the brand and of the game, uh, mm -hmm. they are, they that's a big part of their life, and they've been fans sometimes for for decades, right? And so we not going to hide like the the radical changes that we have in in store for the game. So we pitched that to them. So like, what do you think of these radical changes? I mean, we have got some stuff that you love, we know that you like, and then we get feedback on them. Sometimes they like it, sometimes they don't like it, and uh, some features we uh, actually with with Age of Wonders four. Uh, we, we shipped regardless of a certain percentage of our core fans saying like, yeah, I don't like it because of these reasons, because we then are aware of what those reasons are and we can anticipate on that. But at the same time, if you think the upside is bigger, we proceed. No, I mean, it also plays into post-release schedules and what we do post-release. It's great to have a plan for the DLCs we want to make uh, ourselves and so on, but it's also great to leave room for fan feedback and listen to them and communicate mm -hmm. with them and make sure that we cater to their wishes as well. Yeah, I think that's super important because I think as game developers, uh, not just a company, but I think every, it should be applied to everyone, like we should be take responsibility and feel responsible for having a good line of communication with our fans and our communities. And if that line of communication is not working somehow, you know, it's up to us to sort of improve that. Because there's so much value to be had when you can have a constructive um, interaction with your community and with your fans and with your players uh, to sort of both being able to have a construction, uh, constructive uh, dialogue about what they want, but like how they want it, when they want it, being able to talk about like most of these kind of things and just, you know, get feedback from all kinds of things about the game from the players. Yeah. Super valuable. And maybe uh, to give some kudos also to the UR department, um, sure. they are a huge part of, of, of this process. So like, it's one thing of talking directly to your core fans and listening to them. That's one part of the coin, right? The other point of the coin is doing uh, research with uh, a group of, of players that are maybe not your super fans and get their honest opinion. And uh, not just you know look at what they say, but what they do in game and look at how they actually experience uh, the game by videotaping their play sessions. So, you know, we look at their expressions, it might say something entirely different than what they actually type, uh, you know, in their, in, their, in their form, right? Yeah. yeah, or what they're actually clicking at. Exactly. While they yeah. Talk. And most of the fans, I think, are also 
uh, silent. In, like they do, they don't interact on the forums or as a community, right? They just sit there and play quietly. So yeah. you don't necessarily get access to their feedback unless you do things like you are. Yeah. That might be the largest group. Yeah, exactly. It might they, be they the largest are, group. Yeah. So if you yeah. listen to the to the um, more vocal majority or the vocal uh, minority in some cases, it might be misleading in terms of what the larger playbills actually sure. wants. So you need to be aware of both sides or potentials. Thank you. Uh, let's move on from those broader questions and dig in a little bit more on our philosophy. Just as a help, we'll not go through them all here, but we have five game pillars that describes the experience Paradox tries to give. I'll ask this to you. Why do we actually need them for our whole development organization and how do you work with them on a day-to-day -day basis? Cool. Yeah, I think you can derive them from our slogan, really. You know, we make the games, you create the stories. We sat down and th thought, you know, how can we create a mnemonic for that that people can remember, both our employees, and how can we speak about ourselves? So these pillars describe our business and who we are, the games we make, uh, and what we're good at. So they help us keep us on the straight and narrow, if you will, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. and maybe not uh, venture too far into territories that we're not very good at. Yeah, and we can look at games we made in the past, both successful and less successful, and like look at these pillars and, and see correlations. Like, this is less successful because it was less inviting, or it was less successful because the living world was not very engaging, so on, right? Yeah, but it's also like, what are our strategic goals and how do we achieve them? We yeah. want games that are infinitely replayable and can be monetized forever, essentially. How do we achieve that? Well, through this. How do we create fans out of players who are engaged and love us? Hopefully, <laughs> again, through the pillars. You pointed towards Cerebral, which is an interesting one. Can you give, all of you, give a rundown of what that means in a game like Age of Wonders, Stellaris, or one of our historical grand strategy games? Sure. You want to go first? Um, yeah, so Cerebral is of the mind. So that means that we make games that... Um, do not require players to have Twitch reactions, like like primal reactions, um, but thinking games. That's not just about, like, do I develop a strategy that wins, like a chess game, but it also applies to the player's fantasy, for example, and role-playing. That happens in the mind, right? So just like you read a book, you know, there's something happening in your head which paints an entire structure. And I think that that's really key in creating these um, these experiences as well, right? Because they, th those power fantasies and those map games that we make, they come alive in here. Yeah. So for me, that, that's yeah, a big really part well of it. Said. Yeah, I think it's, um, that's well said. And it's also, uh, th you know, you can think about our games when you're not playing. We take them seriously, we take our fans seriously, we take the lore in the game seriously and history seriously, etc. And you can really nerd out on that. You can nerd out on the equipment of World War II or... Uh, medieval events or the units of Age of Wonders and the lore there as well and so on. Yeah. Yeah. The cannibalistic elves. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's really about that, uh, like, this sort of puzzle and the, the imagination. It's like solving a puzzle, you know, what's the optimal strategy? How do I become the strongest nation in the game I'm playing right now? Like, how do I solve this problem? It's very cerebral. Uh, but then also with the goal that you have an, an internal goal for yourself as a player that can be this imagin imaginative emergent storytelling that you're also engaging with. So that's why it's very, very cerebral. Uh, going from cerebral and the sort of mechanical thinking of it and going into a little bit more of the storytelling aspects of this, which would be living world, which is a pretty interesting pillar because I'm curious, what does it mean to design a living world in a context of ones and zeros? That's a really difficult one, right? Because... Um, we're trying to create a believable world that feels like it's alive. And how we do that is we create like a simulation with all these AI agents that uh, Henrik talked about earlier. So we're trying to create this believable world and have these events and things happen within it that makes it feel like it's alive. So the player is a part of this living world and things are happening in this world without the player being directly r involved with that. So things can happen in independently of the player being involved directly. So it is like living even beyond what the player is doing. And then the player can come back and interact with that living world. So it's really about building that believable simulation um, that makes uh, our games stand out a lot, I think. 
Yeah, I think it's really what creates the replayability mm -hmm. uh, of our games if we do it right. It's about sort of simulating a world but it's more condensed than our actual reality and more interesting all the time. Uh, but yes, it's about uh, simulation to a large degree. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's a huge challenge, I think, especially for the historical GSG, because you, you take an era where people ha already have like this massive interest in, like World War II, that people know all about the, the landscape there mm -hmm. of a lot of, there's many historians who like uh, Hearts of Iron, for example, and then simulating the entirety of the world mm -hmm. for the years around and in World War II. It's a huge task. And being able just to go in and play one of these nations and then seeing how the, the rest of the world reacts to your, cho your choices that, that you make in that scenario, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's an immense draw to, uh, to players. Yeah. Yeah. And every time you start one of our games, you start a new game in our games, that usually you know, different alliances form, different things happen immediately in the beginning that is immediately going to make so that if you, if you just restart it again the same time five, five minutes later, it's going to be completely different, like how it plays. So there's so many things that goes into it that makes it really an endless uh, sort of replayable experience. Yeah, it relies a lot on chance and yeah. butterfly effects and uh, procedural generation and such mm -hmm. tools. Because that goes into systems as well, so because all our games are a bunch of interdependent systems in some aspect. How do you balance or do you even wish to balance those systems? Oh, that's a good one. Um, balance is super good for, for the player experience, of course, because you feel if it's too easy, uh, you know, you're know, you not going to be that immersed. You're going to lose interest in the game and walk away. If it's too hard, you rage quit, <laughs> stop playing. Mm -hmm. uh, so balance serves player experience, I think, um, at least for me. Yeah, I mean, if it's not very engaging, either because it's too difficult or too easy, it, it, you're, not, you're not put in a circumstance where you can try to solve that puzzle, right? You're not getting that cerebral experience. It just becomes, it feels like it's boring or that it's a chore. So it's a really difficult balance to get yeah. the game balance done, you know, in terms of pacing like how many different emotions a player is experiencing in different intervals, for example. Mm. Like, is it difficult now or is it easy now? Am I tense or am I relaxed? Yeah. Uh, I think that's, the, that's uh, the key balance, right? Between uh, excitement and boredom. And that's mm -hmm. the, the flow yeah. curve, right? You want to ensure that people stay between those things and have the, the sweet spot in between the, mm. those two. And I think that, mm -hmm. that's what we try to achieve as game designers. And when it comes to, like, for example, balance in terms of symmetry, that's often that's something that we do not uh, achieve. For example, in, in Hearts of Iron again, uh, you can play a country like the Netherlands. Like, yeah, of course you're, you're underpowered, but then you can still play a particular scenario in trying to save the Dutch government by moving them to Indonesia, fight off the Japanese, and then come back and, and uh, conquer the, the homeland. That, that's something you can do, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not balanced. I mean, you're, you're weaker than the United States, for sure. Yeah. But um, yeah, that, that sort of thing is, uh, is really cool. Uh, Keep it, speaking on balance and the first experience, like personally, one of my first experiences with every Paradox game is about 10 to 30 hours of numbers going red and things going wrong, and then I crawl my way to some sort of working understanding of what's going on. And a very common feedback is that our approach to interdependent systems and high complexity is that it makes them pretty tough to crack and master. How do you design a learning curve to make this moving in process a little bit easier? Well, I can say one thing immediately, and that's... Uh, in games like Stellaris, where you start small, or Age of Wonders, this is a much easier task, yeah. right? Because yeah. you start with one planet, and then the systems are gradually introduced to you as you go along, so you ease into it. Uh, but with our asymmetrical games, if you start as Luxembourg, maybe that could work. <laughs> <laughs> but if you start as the Soviet Union, it, it gets uh, pretty overwhelming uh, immediately, right, in Hearts of Iron. Mm -hmm. so, but I think we've made some strides there in how we uh, bring the player's attention to important events that are going on or si situations. So in CK3, for example, we have a system where the player is notified of opportunities and uh, problems, essentially, that should be solved in a pretty good way. Uh, th those are some things we're doing, uh, yeah. and there's more to be done, of course. It's a really difficult thing to achieve. Uh, some of the other things we're doing is creating like new systems that are more explicit in their challenges to the players, like mission trees or quests and so on. Like, do this, get this reward. Because then it's, it, it gives the player something to grab onto, like a goal in the short term. Mm -hmm. And then they just keep going from these goals. I think stuff like that is also something we started doing 
since a couple of years ago, and I think it's it's also, it's also helping. Yeah, yeah, give the player direction. You know, what yeah. can I do? Yeah. What, so. And of course, we we invest in like uh, very good like contextual help systems. But one of the first messages that we put forward in in Age of Wonders Four is that like, hey, you know, yeah, this is a complex game. And we're not going to lie about it, right? But on your first session, just don't worry about it, right? Uh, don't put the difficulty level too high, and just create a faction that that you want to role play that you like, right? And go from that experience. Do something that looks good, uh, you know, like a cool character, and then play with it, and then gradually you learn. And th so that's the message that mm -hmm. we try to give. And because the one thing we don't want to do is um, dumbing down the game, because people come Absolutely to us enough. for the complexity. That's mm -hmm. what they like. And that's a real risk. It's a good yeah. point. I think that's all the time we have for this panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll have you back on stage for a Q&A later. Thank you very much. Interesting discussion there uh, among high councils and, and logic soups and, <laughs> and all of that. Uh, I think it might be time to remind um, everyone to send your questions to the investor relations email ir at paradoxinteractive.com because we're going to pick a few of those questions for the Q&A session uh, when we're wrapping up uh, this chapter. Um, but um, it's time to move on to uh, to the next panel uh, and dive into the more like the development side of this, making the games happen. Yeah, we went hard on this headline, so it's <laughs> full of promises. Yeah. Uh, we've heard a discussion on the creative vision and design to make our games fun, inviting and challenging. Now it's good time to dig into the material of that process, how to make it happen repeatedly and over a long time span. And with me, I have a host of people who will help us discuss. Please come on stage. Thank you. So... <laughs> That is not the first time this has happened during the event. Uh, with me, I have one of our co-founders and most senior game designer, game directors, as well as studio manager of Paradox Tinto, Johan Andersson. Hi. Richard Åslund, who is heading up PDS Green, who's doing who, the home of Stellaris, and also had a hand in many of our titles historically. And last, but definitely not least, the person who holds our whole operations together our Chief Operating Officer and Head of Studios and Central Tech and Services, Charlotte Nilsson. Welcome. Thank you. So, let's start this pretty broadly. We develop games for a very specific audience in very particular niches. What does that mean in your day-to-day -day jobs? I can start. So, uh, being the Chief Operating Officer means a lot. Uh, we set the strategy. Uh, and overall, we believe in small independent team, but setting the strategy and keeping focus on the priorities is super important. Having this player, the niche of players that we can cater to, I think is uh, fantastic. And there is a lot of focus on playing our own games and uh, liking what we do ourselves. I can just add to that. We, I, I think we probably have the most fun job of everything. Like. The, the combination of creativity and business in the same thing. Mm. Yeah, exactly. We work with incredibly passionate people uh, every single day, uh, which is uh, great. Um, and I really enjoy it. It's also fantastic to have uh, players who really enjoy our products uh, a lot. All right. But let's start with paying homage to this promising title. Uh, and I'd like to move on to discuss success or the success metric, which is a very, very broad term. Some of our endless titles we've iterated on for more than two decades. I mean, Europa, the first Europa Universalis came 2000, which is your brainchild. Uh, in your experience, all of you, what is critical in the development of a successful game? Uh, I would say that the most critical thing to be successful in a game is to actually cater to your audience. Like, uh, making a game that fits perfectly fine for... Uh, the players and you can't do that if you're not the player yourself you have to be constantly playing the game understanding the type of game you want to do and else you can't be creative exactly and it's extremely important to understand what the players want as well right uh, not always what they say but what they actually want um, 
uh, and, and to, to try to sort of gather that uh, feedback both from, from internal play sessions but also when looking externally. Um, yeah, it's a significant difference between what people say they want and what they actually want because a lot if you ask people you know all the analogy of uh, the cars and the dog carriage thingy that that's the same you don't ask people what they want you have to try to figure out what they want is there but the, what's the tricks of the trade to figure that out because that seems like a pretty in a system driven game that's a pretty complex topic I think we have uh, a lot of uh, system to actually work with that. One thing, as mentioned already, is that we play our own game and like it ourselves, so understanding the DNA of these games. The other is that, uh, as you heard from the, the game director uh, sessions uh, and also from you, Yuan, that having game director owning the vision throughout the development of the game, I think is crucial. And as you can guess, with passionate people, we actually have uh, as many opinions, sometimes even more, than people we interact with. So the people in the teams, the people in the company, and our players, etc., have uh, opinions, and they don't say the same thing. So having the connoisseur feeling of what is the actual thing is crucial. And that's something that in the endless of discussion, we, we really make sure that we get there and develop that over time. We also have a number of mechanisms that we work with. We think about peer reviewing, we, we talk about user research, anal uh, analytics, etc., to really dive even deeper. Because we innovate, and that means that we try new things that we actually don't know if people like or not. So we always are sort of on the edge of what we know, and that's why we also really like to, to gather information. Mm -hmm. We also spend some time talking to our teams, especially with the, the, the leaders on the teams, to, for them to understand sort of the balance between the creative side, the business side, and organization, and so on, striking the right balance for having a very successful uh, product, uh, which also makes it a lot easier, uh, so we don't have as many struggles with the, with the teams as you might imagine uh, when we try to balance between uh, what is good for the business and what is good uh, for the uh, game creatively. And to add to the aspect of user research and analytics, we also look heavily on what people are writing, uh, what do you call it, YouTubing and everything uh, online about what they think about the games we're developing and have developed as well. Let's pick up on the discussion of value drivers that we had earlier in the presentation and see, go a little bit deeper into the material with you. I mean... It's safe to say players want more cool stuff or more content to play. Internally, I know you guys often discuss like a troika of innovation, rate of development, and quality of release. How do you actually balance those aspects when you set your studio plans? Uh, so the, the key here is that we try to look long term. Uh, so uh, we, it's quite common that we try out innovate for stuff that uh, might look like we're doing it for now, but it's actually because we are planning for something two years down the line and trying to figure something out. Um, and when doing that, it becomes a lot easier to prioritize between uh, um, what we think is imp most important for the game right now and what we think is most important uh, for the business. We've also had uh, very long creative plans for the long tail of our games. I remember having like written five-year plans of exactly detailed creative visions for EU4 back in the days. And the, you can plan creatively in advance quite a lot. That helps. Exactly. And in those long-term plans, we also lot, work a lot with uh, various scenarios, of course, given that plans, of course, change uh, constantly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was actually curious when you said you had a five-year plan, how much of that actually made it into the final cut? Uh, a lot. Like, the, the, the way getting good ideas were, like, we put up, like, a broad thing. We want to have a warfare-focused one. We want to have a peace there. We want the economy-focused. And then you adjust a little bit. But it's kind of funny, like, looking at back and comparing documents with 2013 and seeing, like, names and focus, like, okay, yeah, we made a Dharma one. Yes, we made an Emperor one. And we actually had that in the original plan. 
Can I add one thing? Yes. Uh, with this uh, innovation, it's uh, for our different IPs, there is different plants. It's not this is the recipe and we just copy that every time. So there is a lot of innovation. We try new things that we've never done before and we do different things with different team. But as it was mentioned in the previous uh, uh, group, uh, we also learn from each other. We discuss a lot what is the learning from one game to another to really see how we can benefit. And it's not always a perfect fit. It needs to be valued. But we, we share a lot of experience and there is a lot of things that we try, meaning also that there is a lot of things that we cancel and say that, okay, this will not work, this is not okay. Yeah, we're, we're, we're different human individuals. We have different skills, we have different backgrounds, we have different uh, things. I mean, we've worked together for 12 years? Yeah, uh, many years. Many years, but we're like, we're completely different skill sets and different things. So, and you like Henrik and Daniel and Leonard that talked previously, it's like we have something in common, but we work differently, we have different judgments and do things differently. Speaking on sharing, uh, we previously said we have an unsentimental view on quality, and I haven't been to an internal seminar where we don't mention quality, but how do you actually define quality for our type of games? Any magic formula? You want to start, Charlotte? I can start. Uh, it's easy to talk about quality and then still people mean different things. Uh, what people easily uh, recognize is the functionality. You want the game to work and that's of course fairly basic. But there is two other things that is critical in this area. One is it needs to be fun and that you can debate endless on what is really fun. But that is crucial for our success. And the other one is also the player expectation and making sure that meeting their expectation. And of course, then uh, our sales and marketing team is also crucial for us to, to make sure that we explain uh, and tell them the right thing about the game. But I, I think uh, this is uh, actually a fairly wide area, uh, especially since people mean different things. Yeah, I don't think the word quality can be defined on its own. It's mm. always tied into the two easy measurable things. Are people buying the product and are they enjoying it and playing it? That's the only thing that we can measure and work on. Yeah, and the key is what Fred talked about earlier. With uh, Our goal is to have endless games, uh, games that we can con continue to develop on for, for a very, very long time. Uh, and what that also means is that when we release a game, what we look a lot at is trends. So is the, t uh, is the game uh, growing, is it declining, at what rate is it declining? It's usually a small decline right after launch. Uh, and then we look at those trends and try to think uh, uh, long term, I make long term plans um, to see the growth that uh, in so for some of our games uh, happens uh, after some time. Yeah, we're like, what is it? I don't know how many times more people playing Hot and 4 compared to the launch. Yeah. And it's been similar for a lot of our titles. So. I mean, we can always make a product and sell it at launch at high numbers. Mark marketing people are really great at those things, but we want to sell that game for long and make more products for it. And worth mentioning, we, we have touched upon it earlier. Uh, we talk a lot about business because the love that our players can show us is that they actually buy our products and we can follow Mao the monthly active user, how well they, they play it. So not having this together with the transparency in the team to actually know and follow numbers, I think uh, is one of our crucial things that we try to be very transparent with our team on how things are going and uh, what can be improved. But it, it is critical uh, to have the business tied to the, uh, the creative when it comes to game. We, I want to touch upon the uh, Richard you mentioned that the, you had an iterative process or following trends uh, in the previous panel we discussed learning curves uh, which is one axis of a broad term accessibility what are you doing to improve games accessibility and onboarding of new players over time uh, so we are constantly working on that. One example of that is when uh, we released Solaris uh, in 2016. Uh, it was uh, viewed as one of our most accessible games. <laughs> These days when we have people talking about Solaris, they talk about it as being one of our more inaccessible games, 
when comparing to CQ3 and, and, and Victoria and so on. Uh, and I think that is also an indicator of that we are constantly at least getting better, uh, but it's still uh, quite difficult because we have that complexity. Our players want that complexity. Uh, but one thing that we are trying to do is, of course, that was mentioned in the panel previously, I believe, that uh, we try to think about how in which rate we introduce uh, systems uh, to the players. Uh, we're also trying to make them understand that they don't need they don't need to understand every single aspect uh, uh, of the game in order to help them sort of get over that uh, hurdle. Um, anyone want to add anything? No. no. Then let's move on and look back a little bit to look forward. Uh, historically, we've been fast in on quite a few areas. The DLC model came quite early, digital distribution, modding, and so forth. So out of curiosity, what are you exploring right now? Plenty of things. <laughs> We're trying out quite a lot of things. Uh, I know you are a big advocate of AI, right, Charlotte? Yes. Uh, and the AI is, of course, big everywhere, but I actually think uh, the gaming industry is uh, the perfect place to, to use it uh, in many aspects. Uh, there is uh, a lot of updates, so we, we try and ex uh, experiment in this area and use it uh, to some extent. Uh, but uh, the updates in these areas are uh, keeping us almost busy. Uh, but I, I think there is a good potential here. Yeah, and uh, not just talking about AI, we try to innovate with the user experiences as well. Uh, in the UI and learning curve, as mentioned before, uh, we are new things we that mm -hmm. we're discussing there. Yeah, we, we are continuing to look at different platforms. Uh, for example, console uh, is, is still definitely on the table. We have subscriptions we're looking at as well, uh, and then various other stuff. Um, yeah, we're always looking at different business models and how we're tying in uh, the business model together with uh, the game design and trying out various things there. So, And I think the, uh, this is crucial. This is part of the DNA of the team that we always try to try new things. Uh, what we say, especially on the live uh, games that we have, that we innovate with a foot in the ground. So we should, of course, take good care of what we know is successful. But we always always need to innovate. And this is uh, uh, crucial to, to offer something new to the player, but it's also to be able to serve in the future. In the future, people might prefer streaming, they might prefer other models, and we need to be there to be able to serve our fans. I'll round off this whole discussion because I have time for one more question, I think, uh, which is, like it uh, goes without saying, great games are made by great people, so all in, of you in your managerial capacities, how do you actually attract and retain people, talent? Uh, different ways, I would say. Uh, we are l in a good position in that we have games that are fairly popular with people that spend a lot of time playing it and dreaming about working here. So uh, a large chunk of the people that we hire working on uh, design-related uh, aspects are fans of the games. Yeah, definitely. And I think, uh, you know, 10 years ago, it was maybe more difficult for us to recruit. But these days, it's not, uh, it's not that hard for us to find uh, the talent uh, we need, I, f uh, I think. Uh, and it's, of course, helped by the fact that we have a very uh, passionate team. Uh, so it builds an environment that's really, uh, really enjoyable for everyone, in including us. And besides uh, having to work with your favorite game, hopefully, uh, we also have fairly small teams, meaning that your impact on the actual outcome yeah. is really large. And we trust people into new roles and trying out new things. Uh, with us growing and trying new things, it's uh, really enjoyable for people and push the boundaries for what we can do. Please, Johan, I, I just remarks. wanted to add, again, we have the best work in the world. And I love my work. We take recruitment discussion <laughs> afterwards. That is a nice way of ending it. And mm -hmm. let's move on. Thank you so much. Please stay here for the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Um, I agree. Um, we have the best job. And please join us, Lennart, uh, Daniel and Henrik, because um, we're moving into the Q&A session, wrapping up the second chapter. And... Uh, uh, while they are 
coming back in here, let's um, start off with a question based on what you were just talking about, AI. We have um, a question here. AI is nothing new to games. It has already been mentioned a couple of times. In the context of <coughs> emergent narratives, is the chat GPT or other large language models a tool that will prove value for paradox? And in that case, how? I mean, it is a fantastic opportunity that we're keeping a close eye on, of course. Uh, some games have already started uh, dabbling with it. It's very early days, but I don't think we can afford to uh, not exploit it for purposes of emergent narrative. The problem right now is it can be rather immersion breaking. Uh, if it says something a little wrong, <laughs> that completely takes you out of the experience. So, but with care, absolutely. And uh, also text-to-speech generation, fantastic. Having your characters in the game actually role play the situation with voice and everything. Um, it's amazing. Um, there are so many areas AI will affect actually. So I think we have not seen the end of it. Uh, there will be many sort of going from uh, te uh, text to speech, as you mentioned, localization, more languages, being able to do that when we iterate and change, do a lot of changes. There is so many things that actually can uh, be done. And, uh, so. and even now, just using ChatGPT and similar models to aggregate data and gather data for you in a presentable way saves so much time. Yeah, it lies a bit. If you ask it for like 10 medieval games, it can say, well, kids played with trains. Wait, no, they did they really? Oh, sorry, no. So no, uh, you, 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 can, you cannot trust it, to no. be perfect. You cannot use it uh, a straight up, but the AI is currently right now is a good tool. It is amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for all of your questions as well. Um, let's take another one here. You've been more or less alone in the grand strategy niche. Any fear competitors might arise? Uh, civilization, total war. <laughs> I don't know. Are they not grand strategy games? Are they not well, bigger than us? <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. We, we keep a tally of uh, close competitors, both well-known and less well-known. Of course, something could come out of China or something uh, completely unexpected at any point. But we really try to create an economic moat uh, and make it hard for people to, to duplicate what we're doing. Um, That's also a reason for being very innovative in how mm -hmm. we work with our games uh, to benefit of the platform we have. But we also, I'm, I'm not worried at all about the innovation here because uh, we usually want to push the borders even more than maybe it's reasonable every time. So we are our worst competitor at the moment. So also be able to hold down uh, on, uh, on where we can go because everyone wants to do the absolute best for our players. I think one great as well, great thing as well with our games when they have a long tail is the fact that uh, that don't only give us more revenue over time, but it's also the fact that uh, these games become quite uh, quite strong. The, by the fact that we continue developing them, that means that we are actually defending the position they have on the market, uh, which I think is also a really good. Yeah, it's a, we are in the same situation there that uh, World of Warcraft was for many years. No competitor could easily unseat them because they had to copy everything they've already done. It's also something called switching cost. Like if a player already invested so much in a particular game by buying DLCs, but also installing mods or maybe even modding themselves, they are also like not just financially, but also emotionally invested in our brands. And jumping to another one is, is a huge sort of jump to make. Thank you. Let's see, we might have time for one or two questions from the audience. We have one here. Carl Arnfeldt, <coughs> Team Founder. Just for Johan, if you look at the pipeline, I mean, given the sophistication in green lighting, is it easy to have a feeling if the pipeline is good or is it more of a lottery ticket when you release a game, you know, succeed or not? And, and second, you know, uh, Imperator, if you re read the recent reviews, they seem to get better and better. Is it impossible or doable to kind of revamp and create a new roadmap for an already released title and go more to the endless perspective? Uh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, yes. 
you, you said do, the world doable it was in your question and everything's doable is it uh, i think it's all about the opportunity cost yeah. mm. it's uh, is this better to do this than uh, spending resources doing something else probably not uh, henrik no no i i agree with that you know it's is it the best way of using our resources at the time and and the pipeline is it easy if, when you work with this all the time you're so dedicated to have a feeling if it's a good pipeline or is it always up until release you you see what people react etc cetera, etc cetera? uh um i find that most of the times if you're listening to the community uh, and you communicate in advance with uh, development diaries and posting stuff and communicating with them that in 90% of the case they have a good feedback that helps you. It's when your vision and their vision is not perfectly aligned that you run the risk that the release is not stellar. Yeah, I agree. I think you need to have a sort of continuity with releases, especially if you have a series of titles. Uh, that you don't let your existing fan base down, like we see a lot of in the entertainment industry, to be honest. We exist in a niche, and we need to take that niche seriously. I can also add that it's, uh, I think we usually have a good sort of, good feeling of sort of how something is going to perform, but of course we never know until we actually have released. Uh, but it's quite uncommon that we feel completely blindsided uh, with the performance of a product. Um, Well, uncommon, I, uh, uh, uncommon. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, I was trying to figure out those. Like, was there any time we were like surprised or unsurprised by? Yeah, but I can't remember. I think I can add that we usually consider our grand strategy games to be our uh, safe titles, right? There's not a lot of risk with it because we've don't, been doing this for a long time. So even though maybe we don't hit the mark in all cases that we want all the time. Um, like we are pretty good at like fixing it long term, and then it's just like we talked about earlier: it's an opportunity cost. Like, what's what's best to spend the energy on time on, uh, and what value can we create from that? Um, but yeah, I don't think we're the the process for new things is not so risky for especially the grand strategy things, because we have a fairly good idea what we're doing, even though we take a lot of risks sometimes as well. Thank you. And uh, that's where we're wrapping up the second chapter. And we're going to take a short break. And then we will be back with chapter three, uh, where we're looking more into the financials of endless games and setting ourselves up for commercial success. You don't want to miss that. We will be right back. Hi, and welcome back to Paradox Deep Dive. You who are joining us from our office in Stockholm and you watching the stream. We are uh, just opening up our third chapter today here, making the most out of what we create. And this is where we're going to have more of a commercial and financial focus. So specifically for this chapter, we expect a lot of questions from this audience. And by now you should know what to do. Send your questions to ir at paradoxinteractive.com and we will uh, catch them during our Q&A session at the end of the chapter. Um, this is our final chapter of the day. And um, kicking off with the first session, uh, there will be a discussion on models, pricing, geographical opportunities, setting us up for commercial success. And once again, Marcus is back. Uh, hit it. Thank you. <laughs> so... So far, we've gone into and discussed how we aim to grow, how we build portfolio, how we develop our games and DLCs, and how our player, what our player base looks like. In this session, we'll focus on how we make all our skills, assets, ambitions, and communities come together in actual commercial prowess. And to discuss this, I have the best and brightest of our publishing team. Welcome on stage. Thank you. <coughs> bit there, so I don't block you. So with me to discuss this, I have Marine Mazel, one of our senior marketing managers, recently working on Age of Wonders and other titles as well. Matthias Rengstedt, our head of sales, 
And of course, Johan Bolin, our chief business officer. And to just start off, Johan, for those recently joining us, what does publishing actually do at Paradox? Yeah, so a brief introduction of what we do. We usually say that we do two things at the company. We make games and we sell games. We focus on the latter. We bring new market, new games to, to market, and we build um, working with we work with building and growing our existing live franchises. So, in all of your respective roles, which are quite different from one another, what's special about publishing a paradox game? You want you want to go first since you hold the mic. I can sure do. Uh, what is special with us? Uh, you ask. I think uh, I would like to highlight three different areas. Uh, first off, this goes very much hand in hand with the type of games we make. We make deep, complex and endless games. And this is the way we need to work as well. Um, we are in it for the long run. We are always aiming for maximizing player and lifetime value. Um, and for us, the release is really only the, be- the beginning. This is at least what we aim for. Um, then we have a year like this, of course. We will release a bunch of new games. We couldn't be more excited about this. Uh, This is a huge undertaking for us, obviously. Um, But we're in it for the long run, and the main focus is always our live franchises. That's the first thing. Uh, The second thing I'd like to highlight is how we work. Um, We don't really know. We do all these projections and forecasts internally, of course. But as has been mentioned earlier, we can't really know how a game will perform before we put it in the hands of our players. This this is very much the nature of the games we make. Uh, So we want to keep... You know, an agile, nimble organization, fast moving. Uh, we we put the we put the resources where we make the biggest sort of impact, um, and very much tied to that is we want to make sure that the decisions are being made from the teams. So we work from publishing. We work very close with the studio organization. We sit embedded. We work together wherever we can, and these game teams are where the decisions come from. They know the games best. They know the audience best. They should make the, the calls, basically. Um, and the third thing I'd like to highlight, the third area, is our community, our players, our fans. We are super proud of the very dedicated and uh, you know, engaged fan base that we have. Uh, so we work close to them with the marketing and sales. Uh, it can be everything from interacting with um, our fans in, in social media. It can be physically at the PDXCon. Uh, or we can even ask what DLC we should make next. We ask what DLC should we make, they say this, and we actually do do that. Uh, so these are the three areas I'd, I'd like to highlight on this question. Matthias, please jump in. Yeah, so I work with sales, so partnerships and the distribution channels. And from that point of view, I think it's the fact that uh, our games are niche. I mean, they're niche and popular. So that opens up opportunities for us with the players and with partners. So we can fill those uh, spaces. And I also work with commercial aspects like pricing and business models. And from that point of view that our games live for a long time, they live for many years. So when we take commercial decisions, uh, we always need to have a long-term mindset. And we need to think about the lifetime value. So I think it's the fact that our games are niche and that they live for a long time. And I think that's also part of our moat. Marine. Please chime in. Yeah, so I work uh, with marketing and for marketing, we have the same challenge as uh, video game marketing uh, across the industry, meaning that we worked with extremely complex product, the most uh, complex entertainment product with the hundreds or thousands of hours of entertainment, a lot of people involved. And um, as uh, the panel before uh, was mentioning it, we have very system driven games and uh, system system based games. So that adds a layer of complexity. Uh, And for marketing, we of course need to understand the essence of the game that we're going to market to convey the appeal to the audience. So for us, it's really paramount that we understand our games, right? And that we are able to to transcribe their complexity and their appeal to our audience. And that's something we know how to do at Paradox because we have this experience with this type of games. Okay. Let's stay with that topic a little bit because like we've been discussing how what the relationship to our players means from a strategic perspective, from a development perspective, but how do you build on it from a marketing perspective? Um, I think the strength that we have here is that we have, we mentioned it several times before, but we have a very close relationship with our players, right? 
uh, even before release of base game, we have those dev diaries that are very integrated in our marketing campaign. Uh, we also have the forum where we gather feedback, where we understand the opinions. And that's something extremely precious before release so we can, as marketing, kind of have a feel for how the game is coming up, uh, how our player base is reacting. But even after release, uh, we were saying before that uh, our games are not born unless uh, they become it, uh, thanks to the community, etc. And that's true. We ha we maintain this relationship. This um, we stay connected, marketing and the studios very closely. Right? We want to be close to the devs. We want to understand uh, the games. So we have this uh, this capacity of adjusting. Uh, correcting course if needed, adjusting the marketing campaign and have like really this synergy between the two things. And we can do that because we are very close to the games that we're marketing, I think. Thank you. And uh, speaking of being um, close to the games or and our players, um, in the last panel we discussed a little bit on the different ways we try to experiment and be where our players are. Roughly, and we've been working with different ways of making our DLCs and our games available. Uh, which models are we working with currently, and what's our takeaway so far? Uh, do you want to start, John? Yeah. So yeah, what's been mentioned and what very much has built the success of this company is the premium sales and the DLC model. And this is, uh, I think it was introduced back in 2012, as Fred showed in, in CK2. Uh, and this uh, has been very successful works very well for our type of audiences, but also for our games. Uh, and this still is a very successful model for us. Uh, the latest example for with H104, of course, releasing with a $50 base game price. If you're a, you know, a fan or want to invest more, you can pay $90. And, and for the $90 premium SKU, you get additional content for the coming 12 months. So you get like the four first DLCs included, I think, at a discount. Uh, and this work ha has been working very well for us, uh, even only a few weeks ago. Um, but of course, we, we want to experiment. We don't know how the gamers and how the audience will interact with our games five years from now, let's say. Uh, so we've been working with several other business models, quite a lot with subscriptions. Uh, and talking about subscription, there are several different subscriptions out there. We have partner subscriptions, like Microsoft Game Pass or PlayStation Now, for example. And then we have our own subscriptions that Fred showed the, the graph as well. So if we start with, um, let's take Game Pass as an, ex as an, uh, as an example. With, the, with this subscription, you get the base game for free. So you, you get the base game and then um, you try it out. Maybe you fall in love with it. You might continue to subscribe or you buy the game uh, to own it forever. Uh, you can also um, uh, buy the DLCs. So it's a great way for us to, to upsell uh, to, to subscribers as well. Um, and this type of subscription has been a good way for us to find new, new audiences, basically. Uh, to reach audiences that we necessarily wouldn't have reached otherwise. Um, then we have uh, our own subscription. Uh, we have it in a few of our games on, on, on Steam. Uh, and this is working in an opposite way. You buy or you already own the base game and then you subscribe to the DLC catalog. This is a good way for hardcore players to get all the content within this sub subscription, but it's also a good way for new players to, to try some DLCs out. Mm -hmm. You buy the base game, you, you like it, and then you want to buy some more content, and you, 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 you know, you're being greeted with this long list of DLCs. Which one should I pick? Try the subscription out, and then either continue or cherry pick the DLCs you really like. So, is that for a, one of our live games, we might have two somewhere in the range of two to four different models at work or different ways to pay for the content. That poses the question, how well do they actually shine with one another? Do we want yeah, to take so, Yeah, sure. I mean, one game could be on several different platforms and it could use several different uh, business models. And we think that they are additive. Uh, we think that they have different advantages. So some business models are strong to reach new players and some business models are stronger for driving DLC sales. So we think that they complement each other and we want to be where our players are and we want to give them alternatives when they buy and uh, play our games. And we also want to experiment, like you said, Johan. Uh, we want to try new things. I mean, this industry is moving quite fast, so we need to be active and we need to try new things. Uh, 
going back to our first session, like uh, paid user generated content stands out a bit because what we've got so far is ways to pay for content and that is a way to enable it. What opportunities do you see in that field right now in our portfolio? Yeah. Uh, Matthias Lille was mentioning it uh, at the very beginning and I think this is a very good way for us to meet the demand that we actually have for new content. So this is a way for us reaching out to the uh, our very very dedicated fans that, that make these um, uh, mods. We re reach out to them, we make some um, high quality content together and we package it as a DLC basically. And I think, what is it, 10 o'clock this morning we released the latest packs uh, with this business model. We call them content creator packs to see the skylines. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, again, a great way to increase content velocity. It's scalable. And we have this win-win model where um, also the creator gets paid for, for, for their valuable time. And we do too, of course, as we have a revenue share model with them. But I, I think we'll see it in more games in the future. Thank you. I'll leave on that note. Because now we've discussed marketing and... Um, ways to pay, and that kind of naturally brings us to the question of what you actually pay for content. Uh, Matthias, we've ha Paradoxes has a new or at least more structured way of doing pricing over the past few years. Can you walk us through your reasoning and take away so far? Yeah, sure. I mean, we have worked more structured with uh, pricing recently. And first of all, our community is very important to us. Our relationship with the community is a big um, reason to why we have been successful and why we have been growing the way we have. So when we talk about pricing, it's important that we keep our community in mind. And we want players to, uh, to experience our content, uh, and we want them to feel that the price that they pay is uh, reasonable and fair. And at the same time, I mean, players tend to spend a lot of time in our games. They put in many hours. So we believe that our content contains a lot of value. And we have been working more on balancing this value that we create with the value that we capture back to the company in terms of price. And consequently, we have increased prices uh, across uh, franchises and also across uh, markets. And we see good results from this. We see a positive impact on our top line and also our bottom line. We don't see any big uh, drops in volume. So that indicates that we have pricing power. And this is something that we will continue to work on also going forward. I'm just uh, curious, and let's keep this one short, uh, because we force you out on the forums at least once a year to actually present pricing changes to our happy fans. How do you achieve that balance between value and content? Yeah, I mean, it is difficult to balance value and price, and every game is different. There's no silver bullet that works across the entire portfolio. And uh, when we set the price, the value needs to be there, and the decisions on pricing are taken close to the games. So the teams are the experts in how the content should be valued. And then pricing has been a bit higher up on the agenda lately. So we have spent more time on this. We have discussed it more frequently. And uh, yeah, so this is something we will continue to work on also going forward. All right. This is, this is a short and snappy conversation. I thought we'd start off with a very precise question. Uh, all of you, please jump in. But I want to let Marine back into the conversation. Like, your job is selling our games and we always want to find new players. How and where do you find them? So finding new opportunities for the game and new yeah. players. Um, I think the what Matthias mentioned just now, the fact that we worked very close to the game itself, right? The product, that a lot of decisions are taken by the team, cl uh, working close to the product uh, is a big plus. We also have quite lean marketing team uh, we all operate on the global level, so we have a very fast turnaround uh, time, right? We can react uh, quite fast. When we see uh, opportunities rising, uh, we can really act fast and, uh, and pursue them efficiently. When you say fast, is it a corporate month or what are we talking about? Uh, no, for uh, Age of Wonders 4, for example, when we saw that the release was getting a lot of traction, uh, we were able to unlock more budget for... Um, paid media quite quickly and the team put together uh, their plan and we a few hours were necessary for that. So it can be very fast. So, blessing, uh, on this note, speaking of finding new players, uh, all of you, are there any geographies that are particularly interesting to you right now? 
I mean, we have seen steady growth across markets for, for many years, uh, especially in our core markets, which is Europe and uh, North America. So, um, of course, our ambition is to continue to grow in those markets. And we also see an increased interest uh, in our games in, uh, in Asia. Uh, so we are working with partners to find opportunities to, to try to accelerate that growth uh, also going forward. And I can chime in as well. We also see growth with new business model. One business model might be more popular in the West and another business model by, might be more popular in other ge geographical uh, ge geographies. And also uh, the, the paid UDC, as I was talking about, um, for example, the content creator packs were released today for City Skylines. There was one content creator pack called uh, Railroads in Japan. And this, of course, is a great way for us to activate, you know, influencers and reach markets more with more sort of quite high quality content. Uh, so we can do these kind of um, activations as well. Thank you. We will run out of time, but you'll, you will be back for the Q&A session later. And I'll leave to you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I can take that one. Uh, so we covered a lot today, uh, but what's the sum of it all? Uh, it's time to look at all of these layers um, that we covered today from a f financial perspective. Show us the numbers. <laughs> and the one that is here to give us just that is our CFO, Alexander Bricka. Welcome. Thank you very much, Paula, and thanks everyone for attending. So we have, uh, I think we have 20 minutes of presentation roughly and some Q&A. Then you're going to get what you all are waiting for, some oxygen, I guess. Uh, but first, numbers. So I'm going to show you uh, three things. Uh, we have heard uh, Matthias and Fred speak about uh, uh, focusing on our core franchises, on our existing franchises. Uh, and I'm going to show you why that makes very much sense from a financial point of view. So I want to show you three things. One is how our core franchises have grown over the last years in revenue. Then we're going to look in, into one game, an example game, and see how the revenues grow over time in base games and DLCs. And then we're going to include cost as well. So we're going to look at a specific game project and look how the cost and revenue develops over time. So let's start with uh, let's start with uh, the game, how the revenues have developed over time for our core games. So if you have followed us, you know that pretty much every quarter we have five franchises that is always on the top five uh, grossing uh, list of games: Stellaris, City Skylines. Crusader Kings, Europa Universalis, and Hearts of Iron. So, uh, with some few exceptions, when we launch new games, these top five games uh, are always at the top five list. And those are our core games. Now, uh, during this period, 2016 to 2022, there is only one of those franchises that has gotten a sequel. That's Crusader Kings, when we, when we upshifted from Crusader Kings 2 to Crusader Kings 3. Apart from that, all the other four games uh, are in the same version since 2016 up until today. Uh, of course, they have received several updates. Uh, Stellaris, as it was released in 2016, is not the same as it is today. It's a bigger game, but still it's the same version. So let's look what uh, the revenues have developed like. So back in 2016, we had uh, just released uh, Stellaris in the spring. Hearts of Iron 4 in the spring as well. City Skylines had released the year before. And uh, Europa and Charlie's 4 turned three years during the year. So uh, fundamentally a very strong lineup. And we did 479 million sec in revenues. So quite a significant amount of revenues, uh, as it should be from that lineup. Now, the question is, how has this revenue developed since then? Have the games been able to maintain this revenue or has it dropped? Let's find out. So 2017, it's actually up 25%. Continue. 
2018, up another 25%. 2019, flattish, I think it was up 3%. Then 2020, up uh, 35%, uh, partly driven by, by COVID and work from home. Uh, then 2021, uh, for the first time in a long time, we backed, uh, we, so I think the revenues for these games decreased with 11%. Uh, we didn't come out with uh, content uh, in the pace that we wanted. But then 2022, another 20 plus percent. So, as you can see, the revenues have neither remained at the same level or decreased. They have actually increased quite a lot. So. From 479 million in 2016 to 1.1 billion sec in these six years. So that is, in six years, that's 135% increase or a yearly increase of 15%. Now, these are, so th th these are the four games that uh, are in the same versions since 2016 to 2022. So without coming out with sequels or with any new games, these games have managed to increase with 15% per year for six years. Now, let's look what it looks like if we include also the core franchises that have received sequels. So that would be, during this period, uh, for sure, Crusader Kings 3. Victoria 3 is... is um, the jury is still out whether it's considered a core franchise or not, but let's include it. It, it has received a sequel during this uh, period, and it has the ambition to become a core franchise. So, back in 2016, of course, we had, we had revenues from Crusader Kings 2 and Victoria 2, so the, the comparative numbers are a bit higher, 539 million sec. As you can see, the, the, the blue dot is what you see from uh, in the previous um, slide. So 2017, 2018, 2019, not much difference. It, it continues with the same increase. But then in 2020, then we come out with the first sequel. So Crusader Kings 3 comes out. And there you can see now, now the revenue increase is quite significant. 2021, no, nothing special happens. And then in 22, we release uh, Victoria 3. So yet another spike. So now it goes from 539 million to 1.6 billion plus. And that's a 207% uh, increase in six years, uh, or 21% per year. Now, I think uh, th th this chart shows uh, why we think it's such a great idea to really shift focus back on our existing titles. Uh, and the good thing with this, uh, apart from 21% per year being a very good growth, it comes with a very limited risk. So, these are all existing titles. There is not any new titles in, in making this revenue growth. And with coming with new titles lies, of course, a title risk. So, uh, the risk to generate this 21% is relatively limited. And we're going to see later on that also the investments to generate this growth is also, I would say, relatively limited. But let, let's move on and see what, uh, what the revenue development looks like for a game from launch. Uh, because this is why this game continue to or, or manage to grow uh, year after year. So this is, an, uh, I'm not saying which game it is, you, you can guess. Uh, I'm not sure you will be right, maybe you will. So, what happens? We release the game, uh, month one, and of course we get an immediate sales spike. But uh, already in month two, it drops off. So month two generates some a third of the revenues that you see saw in month one. And uh, it continues like that. It, it continues. Uh, the, so the blue line is base game. Uh, the orange line is the DLC. We haven't delivered any DLC yet, so that's why it's zero. So the blue line continues down. So the revenue for the game continues down. And it's thus that until we come out with the DLC. And we do that at month seven here. So I think quite a decent pace to come out with the first DLC. And what happens? Well, of course, the DLC come out, comes out, gets its own sales spike, just like the base game got its sales spike, not, not as high, but, but still a sales spike. But not only that, the DLC generates new 
uh, attention to the game, so it brings in new players. Those new players buy the base game. So the base game gets a second sales spike when the DLC 1 is released. So the DLC doesn't only drive its own revenue, but it also drives a revenue increase for the base game. Now, uh, just like with the base game, the second month of the release, it, it, it drops down. And then, some six months later, we come out with the second DLC. And the same thing again. The second DLC gets its own sales spike. It brings in new players to the game, some of th that buys the base game. So the blue line, the base game gets its third sales spike. But now we also have a, an existing DLC, DLC 1. So some of the new players that buy the base game also buys DLC 1. So DLC 1 gets its second sales spike. And you can see the orange line is if you compare the, the second uh, bump at month 13, is, uh, it's higher than month 7. And that's because we, we have more content to sell. And uh, it continues like that with, with DLC 3, DLC 4, uh, uh, and so on. And, uh, and there, there you can actually see with, I think that was DLC 3, uh, there the DLC revenues is actually higher than the base game revenue. Now let's zoom out and have a look uh, at a slightly larger horizon. So now, now let's look at it at some six years. And we're also going to look at it, uh, we're going to look at revenues rolling 12 months to get a better view of the trend. So the first year you could, uh, re you could recognize from the previous uh, slide. So you, you have the base game generating a lot of revenues and then starting to drop off when you come into the second year. But I think what, 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 you, what is a clear trend here is the DLC revenues, they just continue to increase and increase. At that month 30, it's the same as the base game revenue. It surpasses it and it outgrows it. And after a while, we have more than twice as much revenue from the DLCs that we have from the base games. And this is only half of the truth because a big proportion of the blue line is actually thanks to uh, the, uh, the DLC. Because if we wouldn't come out with the DLCs, we wouldn't generate that many new players to the same extent at least. So the DLCs are to thank not only for the orange line, but also for the blue line. So uh, DLCs just continues upwards. Base game sales, well, they, thanks to the DLC, uh, they are able to remain at a fairly stable level. Of course, it's not going to be as much revenue from the base game as during the release year, but it, uh, fr from, for this specific game, after three years, it's established at, at, at a very solid level, and it continues like that. And if you look at the, at the charts both read together, uh, I haven't done one for that, but you can see if you look at month, let's say 24, so that's two years in, if you add the blue and the orange together, we are up here. So, and the same if you look at month 36, we are up here. So, so the first two years, or you could say also year two and year three, the game manages to generate as much revenues as it does in the launch year. So the launch year, which is normally a great year for any successful game, is being repeated. Same revenue second year, same year, revenue third year. But it doesn't stop there, as you can see, because if you start to add the numbers together further to the right, you can see that the total revenue is actually going up. Now, uh, let's just look at it accumulated over the year, uh, over the same six years. It's clear that, that both the base game and both the DLC continues to add revenues to the game. Uh, and it is the DLC, as I've said, that drives this revenue. And this is very good, we think, because the DLC uh, comes with fairly low investments. I'm going to show you that in the next set of slides. But with also low risk, because we don't have to invest in DLCs until we see that they are performing. 
So of course, you, you need to invest in DLC1 before, before you can see whether it's performing or not, but you don't need to invest six years of DLCs. You invest one year of DLCs, and then you see if they perform or not. So we are getting not only recurring revenues, but also growing revenues for many years with very limited risk and investments. Now, let, let's, uh, let's look at the investments. So this is another game, uh, a typical, I can say it's one of our core games. So uh, we start off the development, small team, but quarter by quarter, stage by stage, the development team increases. So the cost increases. So Orange is cost of goods sold. That is mainly development cost. So it's mainly our internal studio cost. Some publishing staff as well, but, but mainly development cost. So it continues like this, quarter after quarter to grow. Let's zoom out. You've seen the first seven quarters. Let's continue. Quarter eight just continues like this. So, and the years goes on, and now we are up to the, during the fourth uh, development year. Now, now the CFO is getting anxious to get the, the, the game out, but we are continuing development. And uh, when we are getting closer to release and having the game announcement, we start to have some marketing costs. You can see a little yellow bump there. Also, the, de the development costs are picking up because now we go into the most uh, labor-intensive phase of the game development. So everything is picking up. Now we're at Q19, so hopefully the game is going to come. And it does. So in, in the 20th quarter, so this game took five years to develop. Uh, so we release the game. You can see the yellow bar is at its highest. We have the most marketing expenses when we release a game. But... Perhaps more importantly, the revenue bar in green is significant. And if you look at the blue line, which is the, the profit, pretty much, the accumulated profit for the game project, uh, you can see that we are doing break-even for this game already in the first quarter. Now, this is, uh, these are calendar quarters. So if the game was released in the first month of the quarter, it means three months. But... It could be a game that was released in the last month of the quarter. Then, then, then we're doing break-even in just one month. So you can, you can try to figure out which game it is and then uh, see, see which month it was. Now, if you follow us, you know that we capitalize development costs up until release. So these uh, yellow bars, the COGS, that doesn't show up, show, show up like that in our external reporting, then we will capitalize it. So, we, so it would pretty much, not, not zero, but, but uh, a lot of the cost would be uh, capitalized. And then we would take it when we release a game. But now I'm showing you these numbers before capitalization and amortizations, so you can get a picture of, of, uh, of, uh, yeah, of, of how the investments are, are, are doing in time. So... Uh, Project break even first quarter. Now let, let's uh, let's uh, move on. L let's see what happens after the game release. You, you have seen it for the revenues, but let's include the costs as well. Where were we? Q2, Q, uh, Q20, right? So what happens? Yeah, as expected, the revenues keep dropping. But you see, the costs are, are pretty much continuing. And that's because we're continuing to develop DLCs and we're continuing to market DLCs or preparing to market DLCs. Now, the, I, I think the, the orange bar is uh, slightly too high uh, from, Q2, uh, from Q20 and onwards because this, is, this was during a phase where we tried to increase content velocity by adding more staff. Uh, that is probably not the way to go, but there, there, that's why the orange bars are uh, higher than I would like them to be. And also, what I don't like with this game is that we are now in quarter number six and we still haven't delivered the DLC. But when we do eventually quarter seven after release of the base game, then, so this is a different game compared to what I went through previously because. I don't know if you remember the ratio because between the initial sales and the DLC sales 
uh, or the sales when we released the first DLC on the previous uh, slide. But here you can see, for this particular game, when we released the first DLC, we got massive revenues. So almost, almost as high. What's that? Like 75, 80% of, of, of the revenues we got when we released the base game. So that's, of course, perhaps worth waiting for. And now you can see that from that on, from, from that time on, now we have more content in the market. We have a DLC. Uh, and then the revenues are established at a higher, uh, at a fairly much higher level. So revenues less uh, costs makes the, the angle of the contribution line. And you can see it is healthy. It's going upward in a healthy angle. Now, uh, a few things here. Uh, one, this is one of our core games. And like most of our core games, they tend to become more and more profitable with time. So this game has at that, this point uh, been alive for, uh, what's that, 10, 11 quarters. So not, not quite three years. But it's still on the project lifetime basis or after being live less than three years it has generated a uh, profit uh, profit before tax contribution of 47 percent and if you just look at the last five quarters we have a profitability of 64 percent and when i say profitability this is fully loaded a fully loaded uh, project pnl so we we have allocated everything down to corporate overhead to the games. So uh, th this is uh, the very bottom line before tax. There is no more cost left at the company to, to allocate. So we are doing 64% on this game. And uh, it is one of the top five games, but not necessarily the one with, with the highest um, profit margin, but it's up there. Now, there, there are a few things uh, I like uh, about this economics. Uh, of course, uh, the obvious 47% uh, profit margin uh, lifetime-wise and 64% profit margin if you look at the last year. Or we're getting break-even uh, already in quarter one. Great. But there are other, I think, perhaps more detailed things to look at. One is that if you look at the, when we are actually experiencing the costs for the base game, it ramps up just before the launch of the game. And this is important because that increases uh, the, the return rate, of course, on the game project. The other thing is that to continue to generate these high revenues in year two and year three, we don't need much. We, we need kind of limited uh, investments. And those investments goes in to make DLCs. So as I mentioned, those are decisions that we can, that we can take when we know with very high... Uh, pro, uh, um, when we know pretty much for sure whether the game is going to do good or not, whether the investments are going to make good returns or not. So, to try to, to summarize these three main pictures, I think uh, we are seeing that we are getting a substantial revenue growth from our existing franchises. 15% Kagar if, if, if for six years, if we are not counting sequels. 21% Kager for six years, if, if we're including sequels. So very, very strong growth, I think. And this strong growth comes with limited risk and limited investments. Uh, risk because 21% uh, yearly growth without adding new titles. So no title risk in this at all. Uh, and the investments are made over time as we see progress. Of course, high profitability. Uh, I think it was 64% on the previous slide. I'm writing plus 60% here. I can say that uh, last year, 2022, there wasn't one of our five core franchises that had less than 60% profitability. So, all in all, I think, w w why are we focusing so much on our existing franchises? Well, we get a very strong growth. We get that growth with very high profitability and with limited risk. So uh, it creates a very compelling risk reward offering. That's it.
Thank you, Alex. And let's bring back the previous panel as well, Matthias, Johan and Marin. Uh, come join us for the final Q&A session. Uh, wrapping up this uh, final and third chapter of the day. Uh, so, first one here. Uh, how have the different trials of subscriptions been working out? Will subscri subscription services be a part of launching games in the future? I can take that one. Uh, as we were talking a little bit about earlier, as Matthias said, we see that these subscription services are additive. They complement each other. Some are better for reaching new audiences that we necessarily wouldn't have uh, reached otherwise. And some are catering more to the core audience. Um, and whether we'll see more games with those subscriptions, I'm sure we will. We have announced a couple already. So City Skylines 2 is going to, to join Game Pass when it releases. And also uh, the Lamplighters League. So yeah, I think we I, I think we will see more subscriptions as well. All right. Next question: How important is smaller storefronts for Paradox, like Amazon and Windows Store? Could you share some color on the smaller storefronts' future in the marketplace, both for Paradox but also in general? Yes, I mean we work with many partners, and uh, many partners want to work with us uh, as well. So we have some partners that are very big and established, like Valve, where we sell on Steam. But we also work with a lot of smaller partners as well. And uh, I think smaller partners is a good way for us when we expand into new markets and new geographies that they can help us to, to support that growth, basically, together with the big, uh, big uh, companies as well, of course. All right. Um how do you view or balance risk vis-a-vis -vis larger development budgets? Well, uh, the, the, we did a big change back in, and now it's almost two years ago, when we divided the business uh, or the project into two. The first thing we do is that we look at whether we think the game project is a high-risk or low-risk project. If it's a low-risk project, uh, which are normally sequels to our existing strong franchises or, or uh, but it, it doesn't have to be but th those are probably the most uh, uh, likely uh, low risk projects then we're fine to go in with, with high development costs from the start because then then, then we're happy to uh, prioritize time time to market and, and quality from the start because we are confident that these games are gonna uh, be released uh, and uh, do quite well. But I if we do the judgment call that these are high risk projects, th then we uh, then we de let the game develop through this uh, new games team uh, as Fred went through. Mm -hmm. And we invest much less during the early high risk stages. And uh, we, for example, don't capitalize those costs until we have passed the most high risk stages. We have time for one question from the audience. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, on pricing in the industry, when you look at uh, your competitors' games and strategy games, uh, etc., what, what do you think they have been pricing up their games in the last three, four years? And ha has it been accelerating with the sort of recent years with inflation, etc. Yeah, I think if you look at base games and big AAA games, um, I think uh, $70 has been uh, more established uh, recently, I would think. But for us, like we said before, I mean, when we release the game, that's just the start for us. And then we will release content over a long period of time. So of course the base game price uh, is important uh, for us, but we need to look at the at the long lifetime of our games. But yeah, I think new AAA pricing is is at seventy dollars now, and it was sixty before. And do you think uh, you, your your uh, re you said that recently you have been starting to look at this uh, more and we understand from the outside some regions have been maybe mispriced due to different reasons but are there any other besides china turkey and these type of countries what are the other two three 
avenues where you see the biggest discrepancies where you want to be in two three years if you can yeah i think we have um, we have done a lot of work on our regional pricing uh, and that has been based on a lot of benchmarking to to other publishers and how they price games in different uh, regions and uh, we have uh, increased pricing basically across uh, all markets, uh, I would say, uh, except for like US and the Euro and uh, uh, GBP. Um, so yeah, we have been very active on our regional pricing and uh, in some markets the, the increases has been uh, quite substantial uh, as well. And we have not seen uh, a big pushback from the, from the players. Uh, so I think they have accepted the price increases that we have done. And now these levels has been uh, established uh, at a higher level than it than it was before, and that we will have with us uh, also going forward. All right, thank you. And if uh, your question have not been answered during this Q and A sessions, if we uh, have not had time to to go through your question. We're going to follow up uh, with a separate email replying back to you. Uh, but um, that's it uh, for uh, for this time. We covered a lot today, everything from, from strategy to development and sales. And we hope that you enjoyed this exclusive peek under the hood with us and got a deeper understanding of paradox and, and what we are all about and um, we're planning to host more events like this in the future we have more content we would like to share with you so please keep your eyes open for that too but um, that's a wrap for this time around thank you for joining <laughs>